right. I think um, I'll ask staff to um, continue to try and work with Alder Hank McKinney to get her online um, in one form or another, and um, we will proceed uh, to call the meeting to order. So I'll call to order the Common Council meeting of Tuesday, July 14th, 2020. I will ask uh, staff to mute themselves as I unmute everyone and ask the clerk to call the roll. Alder Heck. Present. Hennick. Hennick. Campbell? Here. Lemmer? Here. Martin? Here. Moreland? Here. Presta Giacomo? Here. Rummel? Present. Skidmore? Here. Tierney? Here. Vervier? Here. Abbas? Here. Alboris? Here. Balde? Balde? Yes. <clears throat> Bidar? Yes, okay. Alder Bidar? Present. Carter? Carter? Evers? Present. Excuse me, present. Foster? Here. Furman? Present. Harrington McKinney? And then there are a few I didn't get. Alder Hennick? Here. And Alder Carter? Present. All right, Madam Mayor, we have quorum. Thank you. I'll remute everyone. Um, and ask staff to read the instructions for the meeting. Uh, welcome to our virtual meeting. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link in your original email. Members, if you are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. The chair clerk and tech facilitator are responsible for muting and unmuting committee members. When you are called upon, a prompt may appear asking you to be unmuted. Please click OK. Use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions, or request a roll call vote. Staff, click raise hand when you are asked a question. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered to speak. The name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with uh, the Common Council, please send it to the email listed on today's agenda. Uh, Madam Mayor, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I do want to take a moment in opening remarks to offer my condolences, and I'm sure I speak for the whole council to Alder Presta Giacomo uh, for the loss of his grandmother. Um, and Alder Carter, suspension of the rules. Suspension of the rules 2.04, order of business 2.05, introduction of business. 2.24 ordinances and 2.25 resolutions for items so designated on the agenda. Vice President Abbas? Second. Moved and seconded to suspend the rules. Uh, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote on suspension of the rules? If so, please use the raise hand function. Seeing no objection, the rules are suspended. And we'll move to item one, uh, President Carter. Item one, 61145, offering condolences on the passing of Bella Soba, Chair of the Disability Rights Commission. Vice President Boss. Second. Moved and seconded. We do have registrants on this item. Uh, our first registrant is Najua Xantini of Langley Lane in support wishing to speak. Uh, this is actually Ilya Sova, uh, Bella's brother. Um, we just wanted to thank the city on behalf of our family for you guys' solution. Um, thank you for joining us and our condolences on your loss. 
that's our only speaker on this item. Um, President Carter, did you wish to read the resolution? President, uh, President um, Alder Furman will be reading the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, President Carter. Alder Furman. Oh, sorry, Alder Furman, try again. Thank you, Mayor. Whereas Bella Soa passed away unexpectedly on Thursday, June 18th, 2020, and whereas Bella cha chaired the Disability Rights Commission for the City of Madison, where through her dedication and commitment, she helped to bring positive change for individuals with disabilities in Madison. And whereas Bella strived to look at the intersectionality of her identity in a way that positively promoted the outcomes of equity for the City of Madison. And whereas Bella served the city for three years as a member of the Disability Rights Commission, and whereas Bella's commitment to social justice inspired her life, including her pursuit of a law degree and continued to inspire all those who knew her. Now there be resolved that the members of the Common Council, Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway and the Department of Civil Rights of the City of Madison wish to offer our condolences to Bella's family and honor the life of Bella Sola by commemorating her passing. Thank you, Alder. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of the resolution? Seeing none, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of that item. And we will move on to item number two, petitions and communications, President Carter. Uh, item number 260891, petition received in the Madison's Clerk's Office, June 9, 2020, from Betty Real Estate, LLC, regarding attachment from the Town of Burke to the City of Madison. Move to accept. Second to accept. Thank you, Alder Martin. I, I'm sorry. Um, can we come to me after this? I have something else not related to this particular. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Um, I couldn't find my uh, my raise hand button in time to ask uh, for items seven and eight to be pulled from the consent agenda. We're we're not at the consent agenda yet, oh Alder. And and seven and eight are public hearings, so we'll take them up in turn. Wait, thank you. <laughs> yep, you got it. All right, uh, so it's been moved and seconded to accept the petition. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of accepting the petition? Seeing none, the petition is accepted. Um, and we will move on to the consent agenda. Um, and I'll turn to President Carter. Thank you. <clears throat> Move to the consent agenda, items one, items which the registers wish in to speak, item two, I mean two, items which require extraordinary roll call vote and are not included on the consent agenda by unanimous consent, three, items which older persons have separated out of the discussion slash debate purposes. Agenda items four through 12 are public hearing items. The following are extra majority items requiring uh, a unanimous vote unless a roll call is requested. That's item 85, Legistar 60918. Consent agenda with additional recommendations as noted. Item 13, Legislature 61060, amending the 2020 adopted capital budget to appropriate 500,000 for the downtown recovery. Recommended action, refer substitute to the EDC on July 15th, Finance Committee on the 20th, and Common Council on the 21st. 
Item 14, Legislature 61124, amending the 2020 adopted operating budget for the clerk's office, authorizing the clerk, city clerk, to apply for and accept a 10,000 grant from the Center for Tech and Civic, Civic Life Distribution by City of Racine. This requires um, a 15 vote is the requirement, recommended action, adopt under the suspension of the rule substitute resolution. Item 15, Legislature 61255, authorizing the city clerk to accept $1,271,788 grant from the Center of Tech and Civil Civic Life. Rec this requires a 15 vote recommended action adopt on the sus suspension of the rule substitute resolution. Item 16, Legislature 61268, report of the mayor submitting resident committee appointments, refer substitute appointments report to the 72120 council meeting. Agenda items, consent with additional recommend, recommend, recommendations as noted. Item 68, Legislature 60995, creating a section 4.33 of the Madison General Ordinance to establish a downtown recovery ordinance. Recommended action, re-refer re substitute to the EDC 715, Finance Committee 720, Common Council 721. Item 99, Legislature 61250, creating Section 517 of the Madison General Ordinance to prohibit the Madison Police Department from using tear gas mace and impact projectiles. New business referral. Um, additional referrals is to the EOC, common CCEC. Um, and note, a substitute ordinance has been entered in into this file. Item 100, Legislature 61252, creating Section 518 of the Madison General Ordinance to prohibit the Madison Police Department from obtaining any property from the Defense Logistics Agency under the 1033 program. Additional referrals to EOC, CCEC. 107, six, uh, uh, Legislature 61070, authorizing the city clerk to apply for and accept a coronavirus aid, relief, and economic security, CARES, new business referral, refer substitute resolution. Items requested for exclusion, 64, item 64, 65992, Creating Section 8.24, Madison's General Ordinance to ban alcohol from Reynolds Park and the Well 24 property. Item 81, Legislature 60499, amending the 2020 adopted operating budget to transfer 89032 in salaries benefits from the IT department to the mayor's office, creating a new classification of communication coordinator. This requires 15 votes. 90, item 91, Legislature 60375, accepting the report title, Comprehensive Plan 2020 Progress Update. This will be a brief presentation, um, report of the plan brief presentation by um, planning staff. And finally, uh, introduced from the floor for, for referral is six, Legislature 61377, authorizing the issuance of request for a proposal for professional architect and engineering consultant, design services and construction administration services for the existing building at Olin Park. Recommend action, refer to Finance Committee on 720, Common Council on 721. 
Right. So we also have registrants on, oh, on items 13, 17, and 88. Okay. Um, so the exclusion list would then be items 13, 17, 64, 81, 88, and 91. Are there um, any additional items that alders wish to request for exclusion? Okay, Madam Mayor, we also have a registrant for early public comment, and I'm not sure which item that is on. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not... Not entirely sure how I see early public comment in the registration system. <laughs> oh, it's uh, it's agenda item three. Um, looks like uh, Richard Soletsky, who I do not see in the attendee list. Okay. All right. Well, alert me if you see him show up in the attendee list, please. Sure. Um. All right, so back to the consent agenda, Alder Bidar. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to um, record a disclosure on item number 82. I work at UW Health, UW Hospital. Thank you, Alder Bidar. Uh, are there any other items for exclusion? Any other disclosures or recusals on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, uh, I believe we have a motion. Vice President Abbas, a second? Second. Thank you. Um, and then I would just like to uh, let you all know that we do have um, some folks registered uh, as available to answer questions or in support or opposition on consent agenda items. So I'll go through them one by one on item number 14. Um, our clerk, Mary Beth Witzel-Bell, is available to answer questions. Um, uh, and uh, same on item number 15, um, available to answer questions on those two items. Um, on item number 18, we have two registrants in support, uh, Nicholas Davies and Clinton Ott Ford. On item number 19, we have one um, registrant in opposition, Jacob Harris. And on item number 89, which I'll note is being referred, we have two registrants in support available to answer questions, Susan Miller and Liz Wessel re representing the um, Sierra Club Four Lakes group. Um, and then just for the benefit of um, our registrants, if they are present on the meeting or watching, um, we did have people register on items 99, 100, and 110, which are all on our agenda for introduction only and not for discussion. Um, so encourage those folks who registered on those items um, to uh, follow those items through the committee process and register again um, either at committee meetings or when those items are back at council. Um, Alder Rummel. Thank you, um, Mayor. Since um, our city clerk is here, it would be nice if she could just give us a brief update on, you know, not necessarily the details of these two items, 14 and 15, but just kind of where they're at and how's it going. And, you know, everyone's kind of worried about the election. So, you know, I don't want to do anything not on the agenda, but if she's here. I'd love to hear from her. Thank you, Alder Rummel. We could certainly have, uh, since she's registered as available. Mary Beth, if you want to unmute yourself and, and speak to the Alder's question. Sure. Um, we are trying our very hardest to not reduce any polling locations for August and November, uh, trying to avoid consolidations. And the grant that's on the agenda tonight uh, will hopefully help in that effort. It's providing for 
a stipend for each location that would be a polling place. Uh, usually the city doesn't spend anything on polling locations, but this would provide $750 per location for August and for November to help um, alleviate any extra costs that are incurred with sanitization or bringing in folks to unlock and lock up for us. Uh, we're trying to do in-person absentee voting mostly curbside based on the recommendation of public health. And we are, I think, pretty close to getting confirmation from sites that will allow us to offer curbside voting. And the number of hourly staff that we have available and willing to interact with the public in the midst of this pandemic is much lower than it typically would be. So we want to prioritize the areas of the city where there's the most need for in-person voting. And that means there'd be other locations, uh, for example, Sequoia Library, where we might just have somebody stationed there uh, for drop off of absentee ballots and to serve as a potential witness. Uh, because in those areas of the city, the percentage of voting by mail is quite high. And so we're gonna focus on the areas of the city where we have the lowest percentage of voting by mail. Uh, there is funding in the grant to provide a bonus to poll workers who work in August and in November, uh, just to recognize the um, the <laughs> difficulty in getting enough people to staff each polling place. And so that would bring their wages just for those two elections more in line with the uh, way that the census is paying right now for their hourly employees. Uh, but that would just be for the next two elections, nothing beyond that. Uh, currently we do pay the living wage to poll workers, which is $13.62 an hour. And then we also included in the grant proposal uh, drop boxes for ballots. I don't think it would be possible to get those delivered before the August primary, or we would at least be cutting it close. Uh, but at least we'd have them for the November election and resources for doing voter outreach curbside with personal protective equipment. Um, there still is a great need for the ability to register to vote in person, either at the polls on election day or through voter outreach throughout the community. And if I didn't touch on what you were wondering, just let me know. No, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us what's up. I know everyone's interested and we appreciate everyone's work and all that you do on this to make our protect our voting rights. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Beth, and thank you, Alder. Are there other questions for any of the registrants on the consent agenda? Seeing none, then just to refresh, um, we have uh, one extra majority item, which will be recorded as a unanimous vote, item 85, uh, a number of consent agenda items with additional recommendations, 14, 15, 16, 99, 100, and 107. Um, the items for exclusion are 13, 17, 64, 81, 88, and 91. And there's um, one item uh, for introduction from the floor. That's legislative file 61377. So uh, on the consent agenda, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of the consent agenda? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of the, the consent agenda. And we'll move on to uh, our recessed public hearings, um, starting with item number four, Legislature 60646 which is an appeal of the Plan Commission action on conditional use request for 2219 Monroe Street. 
Um, we will open that public hearing. We have no registrants, so we will recess that public hearing. And President Carter, a motion. Yes, move 60, item 460646 um, to refer the file to the August 4th Common Council meeting. Vice President Abbas. Second to re-refer. Re Moved and seconded to re-refer. Uh, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of re-referral? Seeing none, that item is re-referred and we'll come to item number five. Uh, which is Legistar 59691, a public hearing for Alt Brew. We'll open that public hearing. I have no registrants on item five. So we will close that public hearing. President Carter. Move item 559691 <clears throat> for Alt Brewing. Recommend to council to place on file without prejudice. Second. <laughs> Moved and seconded to place on file without prejudice. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote to place on file without prejudice? Seeing no objection, so ordered. Brings us to item number six, uh, Legislature 60174, public hearing for a new license for Soto. We'll open the public hearing. We have no registrants. We will close the public hearing, President Carter. Legistar 60174 for SOTO. Recommend to council to grant with conditions. Um, condition one, license, licensee shall appear at the December 2020 ALRC meeting. Vice President Abbas. Second to grant with condition. Moved and seconded to grant with conditions. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of granting with conditions? Seeing none, we'll do so. That will bring us to item number seven. Legislature 60242, uh, report of the plan commission, uh, creating sections of the MGO to change the zoning at 4728 Sheboygan Avenue. We'll open that public hearing. We have a number of registrants on item seven. And we will start with uh, Sean Roberts of North Broadway in Milwaukee in support, wishing to speak, representing Summit Smith Development, to be followed by Barry Orton. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I had submitted some slides. I think Tim Parks is going to pull up. There we go. Um, I, I know my time is brief, so I will fly through these, and, and I am here to answer questions, as is our civil engineer and uh, traffic engineer and architect. Um, so next slide, please. So we're here. Uh, I'm excited to talk about Madison Yards at Hill Farms. Uh, as you know, I'm sure the current conditions of the site, um, when we tore down the state DOT building uh, on the 21-acre site, uh, the state has maintained ownership of seven acres on the west, which is the state office building and their parking structure. And we have rezoned through the general development plan process and subdivided the remaining 14 acres into the project we're here to talk to you about tonight. Next slide, please. So first up with this agenda item is the area in green, which is the private street network in central green for the Madison Yards project. Next slide, please. And then at the center of this project is really kind of the, the jewel of the project is our central green, which we'll have um, at build out. It will have the uh, park area, which has our underground storm tank underneath it. It will have a stage. It will have uh, various seating areas, a hammock hangout area. And we've built a flexible street of pervious pavement around the perimeter um, on currently on Street D in Gardner Road on the east and south perimeter of the plaza that will allow us to use that street flexibly for things like bringing the West Side Farmers Market back and other events, which could include, you know, music and movies, et cetera, that would utilize the stage and that street area. It really is the central piece of the, of the whole development, and it will be open to the public 
um, through a series of easements. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I did want to talk specifically during this about uh, the, our transportation demand management plan. This is the issue that's probably had the most um, concern as we worked our way through our process. Uh, as a condition of approval of our general development plan in 2018, city traffic engineering approved our, our TDMP prior to recording the GDP in 2019. This previously approved plan was submitted with our SIP application for block six and three that are before you today. In response to feedback we received by the Planning Commission this May and the Transportation Policy and Planning Board in June, we subsequently updated and resubmitted our plan just in June 24th. On, on June 29th, we went back to the Planning Commission and discussed our plan, which included specific firm commitments and clarifications such as we, we clarified the 30% single occupancy vehicle trip reduction goal and defined metrics on how the reduction will be quantified and reported. We committed to fund a B cycle station located on block six. And we clarified the duties and commitments for the Transportation Management Association's TDM coordinator. We also committed to separate residential units and parking leases, which is a, uh, a known strategy for reducing traffic. And we also committed to provide TDMP information packets, including 10 ride transit cards for all new residents that move in. Our TDMP is the most comprehensive plan submitted to the city to date and includes firm strategies and commitments. Uh, Tracy Shandor from Kimley Horn is here tonight in attendance, and she's able to answer specific questions on this plan um, that may come up. Despite our firm commitments in our updated plan, the Planning Commission added an arbitrary requirement to spend $40,000 a year on TDMP implementation as a recommended condition of approval for this project. To our knowledge, no other development in Madison has been subjected to such a condition. It is not backed up by any city ordinance, fee schedule, or former TDMP policy. We are unable to accept this added economic burden and will not be able to move forward if it is included in our approval. And we are respectfully requesting council remove it from our conditions of approval tonight. Next slide. In my remaining time, I did want to focus on uh, the, the general code that talks about the plan development goals. As you can see, uh, of the outline goals, of uh, the six goals, we really meet four of them and are excited to move this important project forward. Uh, block six is just kind of the, the central green in the infrastructure. It does include a restaurant with a future tenant of about 5,000 square feet that will be determined uh, going forward, hopefully. And with that, uh, we would... I have, additionally, I have Kevin Yeska from uh, JSD as our civil engineer who's registered to speak, and Tracy Shandor is also registered from Kimley Horn. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Barry Orton of Lafayette Drive in support, wishing to speak, to be followed by Gary Peterson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, members of council, I am in favor of approval. As a co-founder of the West Side Community Market and a longtime board member and a volunteer at the market, I participated in discussions with Smith Eelbane on the return of the market, citing it to the central green in block six of the development, and I've testified in favor of it at the plan commission. As a resident of Hill Farms for 35 years, I have a long experience with the property, having spent many hours on the West Side Market and also have, having taught several family members to drive on that property. I believe the development will be an asset to the neighborhood. The current status of the property is a liability, and I fear that further delay of this project will result in that status remaining as such for a long time. As a professional planner with masters and PhDs in city planning, I look forward to the development contributing to urban infill and as a valuable addition to the neighborhood. I think the transportation demand plan I watched it be, be argued and kind of be made up on the fly during the plan commission vote. I don't think that's any way to start a precedent for a plan. I urge the council to be humble right now and let, not let hopes and dreams of a perfect sustainable future result in an ironically vacant concrete parking lot for the next five or more years as state workers avoiding the state's expensive on-site parking structure will continue to flood the neighborhood with their cars. Please get this program moving. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next is Gary Peterson of Marinette Trail in opposition wishing to speak to be followed by James Stoppel. Gary, you may have a prompt on your screen asking to be unmuted. Gary, are you with us, Gary? You may have to unmute yourself on your end. I think it is unmuted. Now there you, you go. Are. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, I am Gary Peterson. I am a professional planner. I'm a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. And what, do I, what I oppose is the fact that there's no workforce housing element with this neither by the developer or the city. And I'm also opposed to the fact that this, the sustainability that they built into it or are, are doing grudgingly is really minor. It isn't anything uh, like they could have done. Uh, as an example, when they were asked to uh, outline their sustainability items, they claimed the fact that they were cleaning up the brownfield uh, as an element of sustainability, I mean, first of all, it's required. And second of all, it'll do nothing to save energy in, in the future aspect of, of this thing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, on the workforce housing, the, the developer probably is not going to do it and to wish they would, I think, is unrealistic, but the city could. Uh, we could form a TIF district. You could see from the picture that the area is blighted. Uh, and use the money to uh, provide the housing within our half mile boundary. And if you want some help on picking out the sites, I'd be glad to help you with it. What we've learned is the out of town developer just doesn't go for sustainability. And I think the city needs to get together with the local developers and say, what is it that, that you would accept and come up with some packages of doing sustainability in all projects, particularly big ones like this, uh, and then requiring it by ordinance, because as you heard from the developer, if they're not required to do it, they're not going to do it. So I'd like to meet with the local developers, work on that, and I want you to really get some workforce housing into a project that, that is this large. We need, to, we need to do it, particularly if the city is serious about workforce housing. I don't think you should be coming to Hill Farms, where I live, and not doing it. I mean, we need to do our share here just as well as the rest of the community does. So thank you. Thank you. Next is James Stoppel of Regent Street in support wishing to speak to be followed by Tracy Shandor. Thank you, Mayor and Plan Common Council. My name is Jim Stoppel and my family and I own an 11 story apartment building across the street from the proposed Madison Yards development I would urge Plan Commission to approve the project this evening. However, I would urge them to exclude the traffic demand management requirements. What has been put together by this developer is a huge development, constituting hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, investment. I am most concerned that if in fact they walk away from this development, this 14 acre parcel is going to go a long time before anybody's gonna have the intestinal fortitude to be able to put a project together that includes the amenities that this one does, including the grocery store, shops, restaurant, parks, um, amenities, et cetera. So I would urge you to approve it. I think it's a wonderful project. I think what they put together is huge, but I don't think any developer in this market could afford the $40,000 that's been tied to it for the TDM plan as well as the potential of that going to $80,000 um, or doubling if they do not meet the 30% reduction in single occupancy vehicles, especially when that the, the rules for that game for reducing that is rather arbitrary at this particular point. So at this point, I don't wanna see this 14 acres sit vacant for the next 10 years. I desperately would like to have it developed. I think what's been put together is a tremendous plan and I urge approval excluding the traffic demand management requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Tracy Shandor of Peachtree Street in Atlanta, Georgia, in support wishing to speak. 
Hi, uh, this is Tracy Shandor from Kimley Horn. I am part of the developer team and have been working on this project and this site for the past, I guess, three or so years um, as a professional you know, professional engineer um, helped to put together the transportation demand management plan um, in coordination with the city and the developer. I definitely feel like this is, you know, it, it definitely is the most progressive TDMP without the, you know, additional requirements that were added at our last plan commission meeting. Um, it's it's definitely the most progressive within the city of Madison and and is being used to help model what the city will put together as their ultimate policy for transportation demand management um, for sites moving forward. And we've worked very closely on this. We believe that the goals that have been established and the methodologies that are included in the, in the plan are, are appropriate to meet um, what's necessary for the site in order to achieve the goals that have been set. And we've added in, in coordination with the city, ways to monitor that progress towards the goals and ways to check in and, and communicate and keep this plan um, really a living document, which is what was most important to the city and, and us as well, making sure that we are checking in on what are the things that are effective that we're implementing on the site to reduce trips to and from the site in automobiles and, and how can we help encourage residents and um, businesses and others use um, a variety of modes to travel to the, the site and not just use their car. How do we get them out of their car? And one way that we'll be able to do that is by checking in and, and using the performance metrics that have been established to check in and see what is working, what isn't working. And, and we really feel that this plan um, includes those things. It, it It's something that isn't done in, uh, in, in many other cities. And so it is very progressive that Madison is taking this step in this right direction to have that included. And I think it lays the platform for future plans um, as it is. So I'm happy to answer any questions as you have them later on, um, but I'm excited to uh, see this here tonight and, and, and hopefully get support for the project. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kevin Yaska of uh, Horizon Drive in Verona in support, wishing to speak, representing uh, JSD Professional Services. To be followed by Hello. Sean Zimney. Hello there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Kevin Yaska with JSD. I'm just here to answer any questions you may have regarding site, civil, landscape design, or stormwater management for the project. I uh, just wanted to bring the commission back to the central green portion of the project really quickly and just remind them that when the street infrastructure for this project went in, a large storm chamber was installed below the proposed central green and it's being utilized currently to meet and also exceed the block three and block six ordinance requirements when we made our land use submittal a few months back for both TSS and runoff rate control. As we understand that that's that's very important for this neighborhood, uh, just to slowly release that that stormwater so we're not consuming um, that infrastructure. Um, we also understand that future blocks for Madison Yards, if this project is approved, will have to meet the current Chapter 37 ordinance requirements that were approved here early June. Um, we understand that infiltration is a is a uh, very key component now with the new ordinance, and we plan to meet that with. The green infrastructure requirements whether it be through um, underground systems green roofs or um, you know silva cells which are proposed have been proposed with our gdp approval and are continuing to be proposed in our plans right now so we look to uh, look forward to bringing those creative opportunities forward if if this project is approved and future blocks come forward so here to answer any questions Thank you. Uh, we also have Sean Zimney of Wacker Drive in Chicago in support available to answer questions representing Gilbane Development Company. Are there any questions for any of our registrants? Alder Moreland. I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask the developers, I, I guess I'm hearing two different things. There was one registrant was that was in support, but wanted the transportation demand plan taken out or reduced, but it didn't seem as if the developers necessarily had an issue with that transportation plan. Is that correct? Let's maybe go to Mr. Roberts. Yeah. Um, 
No, that's a good question. No, to, to clarify, the, our transportation demand management plan, as we updated it and resubmitted it on June 24th, we did make firm commitments and outline strategies that we are comfortable accepting as a condition of approval. What we cannot accept is the added planning commission condition of approval that was added at the June 29th meeting, which set an arbitrary $40,000 a year um, requirement to be spent that would double potentially to $80,000. That's the portion that we cannot accept. That was added at the Planning Commission meeting um, against our um, request. And uh, both Kimley Horn, who helped us design the plan, working with traffic engineering and our development team, are committed to the strategies and commitments in the plan as we submitted on June 24th. But we are unable to move forward with the added requirement listing the $40,000 hard requirement. Okay, so just just so that I'm clear, but what's before us now is to adopt this with the conditions, which includes the forty thousand dollars. Is that correct? At the moment, that's correct, Alder. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. This is for Mr. Roberts. Also, mm -hmm. um, I'm. You know, I, I in our plan commission discussion. It was at times just a little bit confusing about what would uh, what expenses related to TDMP work would uh, uh, count towards this forty thousand dollar annual commitment that's that's currently in in our consideration. Can you um, uh, kind of recount your understanding of which expenses? That you're already committing to would would go towards that forty thousand dollars, for instance, bus passes. Would the would salary of the TDMP coordinator uh, count towards uh, that forty thousand dollars? What what what's your understanding of that? To, to to be honest, I'm not sure what was intended. Um, that was not outlined in any of the information we received from the city. I can tell you our, our expenses that we will incur are things like funding the B station, doing uh, funding the portion of the uh, TDM coordinator through the association, um, funding the uh, 10 ride bus passes and the outreach, funding the traffic engineering uh, studies that are required and outlined in our plan and funding the surveys that are outlined in our plan. Um, our concern with the added condition is the number was arbitrarily assigned. We we are not saying we're not committed to doing the strategies outlined in our plan that we believe are um, by far the most comprehensive strategies submitted in Madison. Uh, there is no, no existing policy or requirements to back check those against. And we have taken best practices and worked closely with city traffic engineering to create a plan that right now, what's before the um, council tonight, is essentially one apartment building. And over time, we will be building out the rest of the site. But, you know, our commitment and what we're able to move forward with is to implement the strategies in our plan. And the cost to do that is, is our responsibility. Our concern comes when a hard number is assigned to that without basis in reality and without a, a, a real way to um, move forward, because that will add a, a huge economic burden to the, particularly which which is just one apartment building to begin with. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, ask for some clarification from staff later in the items consideration, perhaps. Okay. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Moreland, another question? Yes. Um, one of the registrants spoke about workforce housing. Was that um, a consideration in your plan? No, this, this is a market rate project. What's before you tonight is 189 apartment units in block three that was designed as a market rate project. Uh, Madison Yards, as envisioned, is a market rate development. Uh, we bought the land as part of our agreement with the state at market rates and the, uh, the private infrastructure and current design is based on a market rate project. So that's something that you would not even consider a certain percentage? No, the, the, not for the, the, the project that's before you tonight is designed and built off the perform of a market rate development. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, 
I do not see any other questions for our registrants at this point in time. So we will close that public hearing and turn to Alder Carter for a motion. Yes, um, Legistar 60242, uh, I move the recommend to council to adopt with conditions. Vice President Abbas. Second to adopt with conditions. All right, moved and seconded to adopt with conditions. Alder Martin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would like to um, propose or move, uh, an amendment to the um, conditions from the plan commission. Um, hold on here, pulling up all my windows. Um, <laughs> It would be to remove the uh, $40,000 um, from the transportation demand management plan from 24 or June 24th um, and leave the rest in so that it would read the transportation demand management plan dated to June 24th, 2020 um, be approved to meet the 30% single occupant vehicle trip reduction goal in the general development plan approval as determined by the city traffic engineer. The applicant shall receive final approval of the transportation demand management plan by the city traffic engineer and director of the planning division prior to approval of final plans and issuance of building permits. Thank you, Alder. That's a motion. Is there a second, Alder second. Tierney? Uh, President Carter will second that. <laughs> um, Alder Martin, do you wish to speak to your motion? Yeah, um, I, I think we kind of heard um, some of the confusion that uh, came about during the plan commission meeting when the $40,000 uh, was added to that particular condition. Um, you know, the the folks that are on the development team weren't sure um, what counted or if there's stuff, things that were already in the um, their TDMP would go to that 40,000 or if they'd have to spend additional. Um, after discussing with some folks, it was, we weren't sure that this could be, or I'm not sure that this can be enforced. Um, and taking that out uh, just kind of cleans it up and, and makes it easier for us to um, administer. Um, I also am concerned that th we don't really have a, a TDMP policy currently. Um, and we have a, a project here that has, um, you know, whether whether people think it's as complete as it should be or not, is the most detailed TDMP that the city's received thus far. Um, and I don't know that that creating that um, or the request for the forty thousand in there is. It seems more of like a policy thing that we should be discussing at a different time, um, maybe we need to talk about a TDM policy generally, but because we don't have a policy to support that currently, I don't think that we should have it in our recommendations. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Lemmer. Thank you. I am wondering if there was a conversation between city planning and the city attorney's office about the, the 40K requirement and whether it's enforceable or if you know, planning or the city attorney's office has an opinion or um, more information about this. Uh, let's try Heather Stouter and see. Sure, and I, I'll defer a lot of this to, to um, Mike as well. Um, we did have uh, some conversations with the city attorney's office, and I think that um, they felt that if the $40,000 could be really cleanly attributed to a 30% reduction in single occupant vehicle use, that that could be um, an enforceable uh, and legal component of the condition. I think that the attorney's office was more concerned with the doubling um, of the amount to $80,000 if the 30% reduction was not met and, and also shared some concerns about um, just the lack of a clear connection between the $40,000 and the 30% reduction. Um, so that's a, that's a brief overview and I, I would definitely uh, turn it over to Mike if he wants to expand on that. Attorney Haas. 
Yes, uh, thank you. I think that's a, a good summary. Um, the basic rule, as has been described, is that we cannot have conditions that would be deemed uh, as arbitrary. And that's, a, I guess, a way of saying that you need to have uh, reasons for every condition, uh, reasons that are consistent with city ordinances and policies, and that basically makes sense. What is the connection between the, the goal, the 30% reduction goal, and the $40,000 requirement? Is there any calculation about what it is going to take to reach that goal? Um, and as was stated, you know, what if you think about if the goal is, is not met in one year, as written, the requirement would be to double the, the, the $40,000 payment. Apparently, regardless of whether the, the goal is not met by 5% or 20% or 15%. So I think those are things that a court would look at. You know, we, we have not, um, you know, I don't think we would say that the, the city uh, could not ever make a case for a requirement like this. Um, I, I think our, our, our top concern was the provision regarding doubling, but I think we wanted to just caution the council that it needed to take uh, to take care to be able to justify the forty thousand dollar requirement and tie it to uh, to that goal and make sure that that uh, that process would make some sense. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Alder. Are there additional questions for staff? Alder Moreland. So can I assume that that connection has not been made? If, if that's a question for me, um, mm -hmm. I, I will say, <laughs> Uh, now, I, I have not been involved in all the meetings. I did listen to the Planning Commission discussion. Um, uh, I think um, Attorney Strange, who's been involved in this more closely, you know, had some concerns, as, as I said, primarily about this, this requirement to double. Um, but there was also, I think he raised some questions about, you know, can we justify, for instance, that it's going to take it would take $40,000 every year. What if the developer could accomplish that goal by spending $20,000? What is the reason to uh, to then require the additional amount? Um, so um, you know, I, I think there, there, there were some questions that we had about uh, being able to justify the reasonableness of the requirement if it were um, challenged. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Hennick. Yes, I recall the the plan commission meeting, and when we were look when they were looking at it, um, I heard a number of comments about um, kind of motivation, and so I would look to alders that are on the plan commission or or uh, staff to kind of comment on. Um, if there's any other motivation other than this $40,000 and, and if that was the reasoning behind the doubling from forty dollars to $80,000 and if there's um, a way that that can still be accomplished so that the intent of the plan commission having something um, a, a mode of motivation um, can still be uh, the, the intent of the, the addition can still be retained. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Heather, is that something that you can speak to? Um, I can try, and then I would certainly defer to plan commission alders as well. I think that um, one of the, the threads of conversation that came up at plan commission was that um, it, it may seem obvious, but you know this is in the interest of developers to come up with a, um, a workable transportation demand management plan so that, you know, so that their project works, and in this case, so that they can um, easily develop future phases and realize the full potential of this large site. Um, now that said, I think there are some, there were some on the plan commission that thought, um, you know, we, what we don't want to see is a TDMP that simply doesn't work 
because we plan commissioners really want to see this property fully develop. You know, we don't want future phases of the property to uh, to remain vacant in the future. Um, I think plan commissioners were, were basically sharing in the same interest as the, the develop, development team to, to really see this, this property meet its full potential since it's such a great transit-oriented development location. Um, and, and they thought that, um, you know, one additional um, motivating factor could be to put um, a monetary value on uh, the cost of of promoting other modes of transportation to residents, to, to future employees, et cetera. I guess in this phase, it's just to residents. Um, and so they worked to try to come up with um, a number that they thought made, made sense. And 40,000 was what came out of that discussion. Um, so again, it's, it's, it was a, an additional motivating factor to put in front of the development team so that they could um, you know, so that they could adequately meet the 30% reduction and have sort of a, a cost, uh, a stick associated with it so that they would be motivated to, to meet that. And I think that's especially where the doubling provision came in at Plan Commission, um, which has later been really cautioned uh, by the city attorney's office. But that that sort of indication that if you don't meet this, you'll need to double that, that annual amount to 80,000. Um, and I don't know, Alder Heck, uh, Rummel, Lemmer, if, if you want to add anything to that. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have much to add, but I'll say that at Plan Commission, I was on uh, the no side of this requirement uh, in the vote. It was, I think, a five to four vote. I think it was a one vote margin for this amendment. Uh, related to the 40,000 and doubling consideration. And uh, I was, my reasoning for that at the time was that uh, I was concerned about the amount, not really the doubling. I understood the doubling, uh, as Ms. Stouter just explained, being an incentive and um, was primarily worried about it being uh, too much. And that's somewhat related to why I was asking the questions of Mr. Roberts about what qualifies for this, uh, because it would be good to know how much they're already spending, you know, give or take $10,000 a year uh, for, uh, and, and I know it varies from year to year. So, and, and we didn't really ever establish that. So the number in my mind was a little bit random, but the majority of plan commission voted for the $40,000 and the doubling as an incentive. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Lemmer. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was my observation too, that the 40K was a, a way of you know, adding in more accountability and having a consequence for, for not hitting the, the goals of the plan. Um, that said, it, the conversation did get, you know, at least for me, it got kind of convoluted. Um, and I I can't say, you know, where the, the 40K number, how we landed on that exactly. I think I'm I'm inclined to support the, the amendment. Um, and perhaps, you know, having some requirements and uh, some guidelines for developing uh, TDMs in the future could be something like a collaboration among the, the boards, commissions, and committees that work on transportation and plan commission. Thank you, Alder. Alder Rummel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I voted for the amendment at plan commission. I, I will probably support this amendment. I think the point that it's um, a larger conversation that we need as policymakers is legitimate. And we did as I recall from the discussion, um, at least one member of the plan commission believed that staff had kind of brought up this idea, but then didn't really um, support it at, at, during the debate. And I don't want to misrepresent, and I can't find anything as I skim through all ma the materials, which are huge, to, to show where they said that. But I think that was the impetus, for, at least partly for this. And, and I think the big 
one of the questions that we could discuss now is, um, it is a TD, uh, GDP for a larger project. The project before us isn't a big thing and maybe doesn't have a lot of um, um, an office or retail parking, but the developers did propose in their plan, their TDMP plan, to separate the cost of residential parking from residential leases, but they didn't do the same thing for the retail and commercial uses, which again are in a future phase. So it might be something to consider, you know, signaling that the, at least that we would encourage them to, um, to present future phases with parking and um, unbundled from, from leases. And then there are other, you know, we did spend some time talking about sort of a, a list of things you could pick from to, to meet this, these goals. And one thing um, that I think I brought up briefly is if there were a daycare center there and you didn't have to drive somewhere to take your kid to work, or if you're on your way to work and your kid was there, that might be something that could contribute that was meaningful and had a value. But, you know, obviously that's a future phase and a future discussion. Um, so, but the, I guess my point is like, so what is our going to tell them about future phases? So what expectations do we have given that we don't have, you know, a really clear plan just because this is the biggest pr project that we've seen that has, as, as the alder said, a TDM. But we have actually funded other um, employers. So this isn't a first. We, we spent money, um, or the UW Health spent money to send buses to their facility at American Family when that development went forward. And so there is sort of a case to be made for an amount of money. But again, that was a very specific goal for the money. So I think, you know, having heard from the city attorney about we need to have a more clear relationship for the money and what they're pro providing, I think is, is a fair argument. So, but I still think we need to discuss further and could leave at least room in this T GDP to ask for that coming back in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. All right, I believe that brings us back to questions for staff. Um, Alder Foster, questions for staff? Uh, yeah, could someone uh, maybe from planning just give us a sense of the kind of overall cost of this project and the expected um, I guess with the potential component, what the expected um, revenues are with this, just to give us a sense of scale for what this 40K is. That's a great question. I don't have that answer. Um, let me, I know Tim Parks is on this call as well and he reviewed the project. He may know more on that. Uh, Tim, you should be uh, unmuted now. Oh. There you go. My apologies, I didn't hear the uh, question, Alder, if you would care to repeat. Yeah, the, the question is to get a sense of the size of this project and in a dollar amount to um, understand what a $40,000 requirement is. So uh, what's the construction cost or what and or what's the anticipated uh, rents that would be coming in with this project once it's built out? I don't believe I have that information. That'd be a better question to pose to the applicant, frankly, if that would be appropriate to the body. Uh, is there any objection? Thank you, Mr. Parks. Um, is there any objection on the body um, to bringing back the applicant to answer that question? Seeing none, uh, can our tech facilitators bring back the developer? I, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Did you hear the elders' question? I did. I did, and, and I do think it's important. I know. I know it's 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 hard to separate the overall project at full build out for our our specific implementation plans that are before you today. So, what's before you today is the private street network and one you know, relatively modest of all the blocks, uh, block three, which is 189 units and about 10,000 square feet of commercial space. So that is more of a traditional mixed use apartment building that is all over Madison. Um, you know, I, I would add that none of those other buildings have had this kind of TDM requirement. Um, our, as I said, this project is about 189 units uh, that would be paying market rent. And you know the project itself, uh, from a construction cost, is north of probably thirty million dollars. 
And then, uh, you know, when we get commercial tenants, that would be part of the, the first floor. But it, again, it is, it is 189 apartments and that's it. So I know at full build out, as we come back for each SIP, this project will develop. We will be able to identify future office and um, other retail and, and residential tenants. But right now, what's before for approval and that we need to move forward on is just this one block and, and the private street network. Thank you all there, does that answer your question? It does. I have a follow-up for planning staff. All right. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. And we'll go back to planning staff. Go ahead, Alder. Uh, so the TMP um, and the and the, the specific condition, uh, does that apply to the, um, is it expected to apply to the full build-out? Um, what's the relationship between that requirement and just what's in front of us tonight versus the overall project? Great question. So the, the general development plan, so that's for the entire property, does have a condition on it that uh, that their transportation demand management plan reduce the single occupant vehicle use by 30%. And so that, that runs with the general development plan. Um, they went into much more detail with the submittal of this specific implementation plan, which is for the green and for the residential building. Um, and that includes the commitment to unbundle the parking costs from the rent costs in the, in the uh, residential building, um, the commitment to support the bike share, um, as well as a commitment to purchase the, the 10 pass transit cards for each new resident um, upon move in. So those are sort of three of the main things. And there, there might be a few others, but those are the ones that um, were clearest and, and most prominent in my recollection that, that really tied to this specific phase. And then what is the opportunity to uh, revisit or change or add conditions related to a TDMP for future phases? Well, when each phase comes forward as a plan development specific implementation plan, they will need to um, basically detail what they're doing with, with that particular phase. And I think that, you know, for instance, if they come in with a large commercial and, or employment use, it will have a different strategy than one would have in a residential building. So we'd expect to see some more detail um, associated with the future uses that, that come forward as individual specific implementation plans. But that overall goal um, property-wide uh, would remain for a reduction of 30%. And do, would we retain the ability through a, a condition to add uh, a requirement like the 40,000 expenditure um, in a future phase? Or is this our only moment to do that? No, no this isn't the only moment. I think that um, this is pertaining to this specific phase only. And um, short answer would be yes, that if we could create a really clear linkage between a monetary value and a 30% reduction, that is something that we could reconsider um, with a future phase. But I think we, we would need to have some more clarity on the, the connection. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Are there are other questions for staff at this time. Alder Evers. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, follow up to Alder Foster and then for Heather, um, under continuing jurisdiction, could we put into the conditions a, a date by which the applicant would report back or, or put in some kind of means by which this could be monitored by plan commission, allowing for uh, the potential for uh, some new understanding to be codified and put into the conditions either for the future projects. But my guess is, is that this, the importance of the traffic demand management plan, despite the fact that, that we're not 100% clear as to the connections between money spent and anticipated reductions, we're gonna find out more moving forward and we should create the possibility for that. So. Can we come up with a date and put that into the conditions where they would report back to plan, a commit, plan commission? So at, at this time, what I understand to be the, the new condition 
um, it's actually the the analysis comes back to the city traffic engineer, um, Yang Tao, and not to the plan commission. So unlike a, unlike a conditional use, uh, a plan development actually does not have the provision that the plan commission has continuing jurisdiction over it. Uh, and, and so we don't have that uh, tool uh, at the ready to be able to utilize. But again, the, the, the tool here in the condition that's, that's before you in this amendment would require that um, the TDMP be approved uh, to meet this 30% trip reduction goal. Um, and the approval could be determined by the city traffic engineer. I think that the council could add um, a date, you know, if, if you want that uh, an analysis to be done, you know, I'll say starting annually after, after development is completed after development of this phase is completed. I think that's something that the council could consider adding, but I'd want to um, defer to Yang um, as well to get his insights on that. Let's see. I don't, uh, there you are. Go ahead, Yang. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Heather is uh, correct. Uh, you know, before the city has a clear uh, TDM uh, ordinance and a better structure to, uh, you know, follow up with uh, this TDM piece, uh, I think, you know, traffic engineering division will be, uh, you know, working with uh, uh, the developer on, follow on following up. Uh, you know, for this case, we already discussed, uh, we're going to review the performance on an annual basis, initial, at least initially, uh, to see you know, where the development is at, whether they meet a 30% goal or not. Uh, you know, if they don't meet it, uh, what adjustments can they, need, can, can they make uh, to further improve it? Uh, you know, initially, I think for the first five years, I need to you know, uh, review annually. But after that, if they meet the goal and everything uh, becomes a routine, uh, maybe that review can be uh, less frequent. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of already part of consideration, but uh, I agree with Heather that if the council wants to set a, you know, a date, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that can definitely be done. That's a great question. Alder, does that speak to your question? Yes, it does. And I'll defer to those who are uh, wiser than I am as to what that date should be if, if there's consensus or the spirit of the body to add something like that. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster, question? Yeah, I, I think either for Yang or Heather, um, without, or if we approve the amendment and remove the, the condition for needing to spend 40 as well as the doubling, what, um, what happens if the performance goals are not met in the TDMP? So if uh, let's let's take the worst case scenario, the developer really doesn't even try, and we're not seeing any any progress. What leverage does the city have to uh, intervene? So that that is a great question. You know, that's something that we discuss a lot internally uh, among staff. And I think that's also one of the major concerns of uh, you know plan commission, and also transportation policy and planning board. Uh, again, you know without a clear kind of TDM ordinance uh, in place, uh, you know the uh, you know how you, you know, maybe we can call it enforcement. You know enforcement of the plan is always a, a challenge. Um, so uh, you know we we can work with uh, the developer. Uh, uh, you know, bug them all the time about a 30% goal, but if they don't meet it and, uh, uh, you know, if choose uh, uh, not to meet it, um, you know, it, you know it, we can definitely, you know, uh, do something in terms of, you know, future approval of the future blocks, but in terms of, you know, the blocks already approved, um, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a limited amount of authority that is, uh, at least from city staff perspective that we can do. Uh, but uh, I will also defer that question to Heather and also attorney uh, Haas. Uh, maybe they can you know, offer more insights on that. Uh, 
Attorney Haas, any additional insights? Well, I'm an attorney, so there's always a lawsuit. Um, I, I have to say, I haven't, I haven't looked specifically at the enforcement uh, ordinances for development plans for, for Madison, but um, you know, I think it's a good point that if there's, a, if there's an ordinance developed, um, that would be an issue to consider. Um, uh, and, and, you know, like in anything more specifically, um, there's always a litigation route. Alder, does that address your question? It does. I just had one other question, if that's all right. Go ahead, Alder. Uh, I, th I think this one might be best answered by Tom Lynch. I don't see Sabrina on the, the meeting. Uh, the question is just an estimate of the cost to construct one uh, structured parking spot. Um, I guess from our experience doing our parking ramps, what's, what's the ballpark cost to create one uh, structured parking stall? Uh, 25,000 to 35,000. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Martin. Uh, thank you. Um, I think this question would be for Heather or Tim. Um, are there any existing um, reporting, uh, I don't want to say options, but reporting guidelines or anything um, in the, the most recent TDM? Uh, go ahead, Tim. Oh, sorry, try again. There you go. There, there is a condition, uh, I believe it's number 34 in the addendum that is in the uh, council's materials for these two items, uh, both 60242 and 243, that uh, require uh, the study that uh, uh, Yang referred to in his comments a few moments ago. And so that'll be worked into the June 24th document or the successor to the June 24th document that if the project is approved, uh, there will hopefully be a, a TDM condition of some sort. And that TDM will ultimately include a, a study protocol that'll be approved by Yang and his staff uh, that can uh, be the, the foundation for figuring out uh, whether or not they're meeting the 30% uh, trip reduction goal from the, the general development plan. Well, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, and I, I guess I wanted to follow up. Would it be the the TDMP, like the manager that that kind of handles that kind of reporting for the project? Because they that's part of the plan, correct? To have a like a TDM manager or liaison or something. The, there's going to be a a, a coordinator that's yeah. going to be identified as part of the 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 final plan and that coordinator will be responsible for uh, myriad things that are outlined in the TDM. Uh, I think ultimately, and I would defer to, to Yang's expertise on this further, but uh, they'll probably need a third party uh, to prepare the study. Uh, it might be beyond the, the area of expertise for uh, a coordinator who we anticipate will probably be someone for more of a property management uh, uh, position who among his or her duties is to uh, be the TDM coordinator or the TMA coordinator uh, to throw another acronym at you, but that there'll be a third party study uh, that'll uh, be prepared that will be provided to the traffic engineer uh, to basically show how they're doing. And I'll yield to, to Yang or to Tom uh, for, for more on that. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, Tim is correct. Um, depends on, you know, how the position of the TDM quality uh, is structured. Uh, uh, you know, that study can be done, uh, you know, by that uh, uh, person, if that person is, uh, uh, you know, struck in a way that's mainly focused on, uh, uh, you know, TDM. Uh, but more likely, you know, it may need some outside help, uh, such as a consultant, or um, there's some um, 
um, help available, you know, th through uh, uh, our MPO as well. Uh, we are, so there is a TDM position uh, uh, in MPO and we are working, you know, with her, um, you know, on the, on the plan right now. Uh, it's also our plan to work with her uh, and the TDM coordinator uh, as we uh, move on when the project is developed and, uh, you know, they are doing study and we're reviewing it and uh, uh, then we will uh, find out whether a 30% goal is, meet, is met or not and whether uh, additional measures uh, should be taken and what measures should be taken. Um, but I should point out that the, uh, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, there is a TDM quality position proposed um, and committed by the developer, that's, you know, that's a big progress for, uh, you know, for our, for our city. Uh, we actually, we haven't, you know, for all, all the previous projects, uh, we uh, haven't been able to, uh, to do that. So I should, uh, I'll see that, you know, that's definitely progress and there are lots of strong points about, uh, you know, the plan that uh, uh, submitted, uh, uh, you know, including the city's first transportation management association and, uh, you know, many measures that the uh, development team and the planning staff already mentioned, like the bus, uh, turn right bus card. Uh, also, I'm excited about, you know, the uh, uh, twice annually, uh, they're going to host a commuter fair, uh, kind of educate uh, the residents about different commuting op commute options uh, that's available. Again, that's done through with collaboration with uh, the MPO, uh, TDM staff. Um, so there, um, uh, I think, comparatively speaking, from uh, for our past projects, uh, you know, this, this is uh, uh, one of the strongest uh, plan that uh, uh, you know we have we have done so far. Uh, but again, I think you know uh, uh, the, the concerns from the plan commission and the TPBB, uh, you know, are very valid, uh, especially if uh, um, the development. Uh, do not uh, follow up on those on those uh, items in the plan. You know what's what the city can do. Uh, uh, you know to force them to achieve that goal. Does that address your question, Alder? Thank you, Alder Rommel. Question: um, Would it be appropriate to make an amendment now, Chair? Uh, not at the moment, Alder, because uh, we're still on Alder Martin's amendment and questions around that. Okay. Um, so once we get through that, I, I would want people to consider looking, if you can look at uh, condition number 34 in the June 29th addendum, it talks about the, um, the mode share study that the applicant has agreed to do. And I think we should consider adding that it would be re presented, this mode share server presented to the TPPB on an annual basis. So I would make that later after we finish this topic. Thank you, Alder. All right, do we have additional questions for staff at this point? All right, so that takes us back to Alder Martin's amendment. Um, and Alder Martin, I'm gonna ask you to just restate. Okay, hold on a sec. Um, so I would, I, I am proposing that we change the language in the, the um, conditions to read that the transportation demand management plan dated June 24th, 2020, be approved to meet the 30% single occupant vehicle uh, trip reduction goal in the general development plan approval as determined by the city traffic engineer. Uh, the, uh, the applicant shall receive final approval of the transportation demand management plan by the city traffic engineer and director of the planning division prior to approval of final plans and issuance of building permits. Thank you, Alder. So that's the motion before us. Is there any discussion? Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of that amendment? Alder Foster, is that a request for a roll call? Um, no, I just actually want to just make a comment. All right, go ahead, Alder. Thanks. So I... Um, I will uh, reluctantly be supporting the amendment. Um, I, I do think this is a really critical 
issue, um, and I um, I think it's problematic to hear from the developer that they simply can you know that this would make the project go under. Um, but I, I do think that it is fair to say that we have a little bit more work to do to get some better definition around the requirements. Um, we did get a presentation at TPPB at our last meeting, and this is something that staff is working uh, hard on so that we can get a better defined TDM policy. Um, um, and I think this has really called out some of the issues that we're going to run into as we implement it. Uh, but given the the challenges with some of the things that were brought up by the attorney's office, um, I, I will support removing the requirement at this time. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Campbell. Yeah, um, we did discuss this and the more general um, need for policy at TPPB and the fact is there is zero accountability to the developer for, for this plan. Um, and if, if they're balking at investing $40,000 um, to, a, as an accountability measure, I wonder how much, I mean, that means they're probably not even investing anywhere near that much in their so-called plans. And it is troubling to me that they would, they would, um, they would threaten to just pull out if we, if we required them to have some skin in the game and to be accountable for these transportation demand, uh, de demand management plans. It's a, going to be a huge issue for that neighborhood. It's a huge issue for our city, but for that neighborhood in particular, yes, this is just one building, um, but we really need to start requiring this of developers. And just because we haven't required this before doesn't mean we can't start requiring it. Yes, it would be better if we had a policy in place and we are working on that. And I think the, the um, solution is not to just take out all the accountability, but would be to refer it until we can get a legally defensible um, accountability measure in. So I'm, I'm not gonna support um, taking out the accountability. Thank you, Alder. Is that a request for a roll call? Yeah. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree uh, to a certain extent with much of what's been said about the lack of accountability and, and I'm going to support this. But I, I, I think the question that Alder Foster asked about the cost of a, of a, a one stall in a parking structure was, was quite revealing. And uh, I, I kind of find the the argument over $40,000 a little bit insulting. And uh, that said, uh, I, I did at plan commission, as I mentioned, find the requirement and the doubling not well thought out and, and difficult. So I didn't support it. Um, and I look forward to future uh, land use applications and uh, specific development plans related to the the other portions of this where I hope at that point we will have uh, a solid TDMP ordinance and um, the development team uh, can be required to do a lot more. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Hennick. Um, I will not be supporting the amendment um, for the reasoning that um, I think that just in what they've got laid out for the plan, it, it's, it would be fairly easy to, to correlate that with the expenses that are already proposed. Um, and looking at the doubling, it, it makes sense to me that if, if what was being attributed to those expenses wasn't sufficient to achieve the goals in the first place, that um, an increase in uh, resources allocated to that goal would be necessary. So I, I I understand, I, I hear what everybody's, everyone's saying and that we need a better plan, but you, you do have to start someplace. And uh, I, I don't think that this is an unreasonable ask. And I, 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 did, I do find it frustrating that um, a project of this size would be, that there would be a proposal or, or the presumption made that it would just be canceled because of a $40,000 requirement. So that was, that was a little difficult, but uh, that's my reason. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. 
Is there any further discussion? All right, seeing none, then we have requested a roll call vote. Um, so on Alder Martin's amendment, I will ask staff to keep themselves muted, unmute you all. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment, aye. Those opposed, no, as your name is called and the clerk will call the roll. Alder Heck? Aye. Aye. Hennick? No. No. Kemble? No. No. Lemmer? Aye. Aye. Martin? Aye. Aye. Moreland? Aye. Aye. Presta Giacomo? No. No. Rummel? Aye. Aye. Skidmore? Aye. Aye. Tierney? Aye. Aye. Verveer? Aye. Aye. Abbas? Abbas? Aye. Aye. Alboris? Alboris? Alder Alboris may have had to leave at eight. Okay. Balde? Balde? Alder Balde? Aye, aye. Can you hear aye, me? Okay. Yeah. I do hear you now. Thank you. Bidar? Aye. Aye. Carter? Uh, Carter? Sorry. Alder aye. Carter? Aye. 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 Evers? Aye. Aye. Foster? Aye. Aye. Furman? Aye. Aye. Harrington McKinney? Aye. Aye. That is three no's and 16 ayes. 16 ayes. That amendment passes. I will remute you all. Um, and uh, let's see. Alder Hennick. Alder Hennick, did you wish to speak? All right. Alder Rommel will come back to you. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move another amendment to um, change the second to last sentence on condition number 34 in the June 29th addendum. It's on page eight. And to add at the end, and the mode share survey shall be presented on an annual basis to the Transportation Policy Planning Board. All right, there's a motion. Is there a second? Alder Balde? Second. All right, it's moved and seconded. Alder Rommel, do you to speak to the amendment? Thank you. I, I think as this project moves forward, it would be good to have a, a, a board's committee commission role in keeping an eye on as it moves forward and if there are changes to our ordinance. And that would be one way to just make sure we're staying accountable and keeping an eye on whether they're meeting their goals and help them if they're not and suggest ideas. So I hope you'll support it. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Is there any discussion on Alder Rummel's amendment? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of Alder Rummel's amendment? Seeing none, uh, we will record a unanimous vote in favor. And that will bring us back to the main motion. Is there any discussion on the main motion as amended? Seeing none, the motion is to adopt uh, with conditions as amended. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of adoption? Seeing none, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of adoption of that item. And that will take us to item number eight 
which is Legistar 60243, creating sections of the MGO to change the zoning at 702 Gardner Road. And we will open that public hearing. We do have registrants starting with Mr. Roberts of Milwaukee and Summit Smith Development in support wishing to speak. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, Tim, if you could pull up the slides for this one. So I know I already kind of covered the, the scope of, of the first actual building that we're presenting tonight. So that would be block three, which is before you. Next slide, please. Um, so that area is the area in yellow adjacent to the state parcel. Next slide, please. So this, this is a uh, rendering looking east. You can see the existing state, or looking west, I'm sorry, the existing state building in the background. We are at 189 units. Uh, we we are uh, market rate, as we discussed. We have an internal courtyard surrounded by a U building. It's uh, five stories of residential over the uh, podium, which on University Avenue has underground parking in the lobby of the apartment. And then on Madison Yards Way to the south, there's a one floor grade difference uh, that we will have the commercial facing the central green. Uh, and that commercial area will be about 10,000 square feet um, of multiple tenants. Next slide, please. This is a view from University uh, looking south, and that's the new entrance that was added with the state project. That's Gardner Road. So you can see the, the apartment lobby, and then um, you can see one of the amenity decks on the top, uh, on the top of the building. Uh, and then the parking will be underground, and then it's two stories. It's underground, and then at the main level as well, uh, wrapped by units along University on the second floor. Next slide, please. Uh, I know one of the registrants, Gary, had indicated that our, we do not have sustainable features. We, we do strongly disagree with that. We have committed um, in our design to include the design features of sustainability. Some of the highlights are that are we are designing this to be solar ready, including having the chases in place and the necessary roof area and structure to allow for solar power. We are still actively exploring that. Um, there are some expiring tax credits coming and, and we are looking into that. Uh, and we are committing to design the building to to allow for that addition in the future if it is economically viable. Uh, we, we did in, include um, a lot of open space exceeding the code. We have LED lighting throughout, uh, low flush fixtures, et cetera. Uh, we do have uh, Craig Pride from KTGY, who is our architect, uh, registered to speak tonight and can uh, speak in more detail to the building design itself. Next slide, please. I know we already went over this. Um, it is, it, and we will be asking for the same amendment for block three. It's my understanding procedurally that, that they're separate actions. So we'll be asking, uh, for the same type of amendment that we just went through for the, the TDMP. Um, I guess just a note on the $40,000 is an annual cost. It's not a one-time cost that was indicated. So again, I'd be happy to speak into that in more detail, but we, we do have serious concerns with the, um, imposition of the added planning commission approval. And it's our understanding that it needs to be amended out of both approvals for both SIPs since they're independent actions. Next slide. That might be it. And, and as I mentioned, Craig Pride from KTGY will be speaking uh, in addition to the building design. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Craig Pride of Chicago in support, wishing to speak, representing KTGY Group, to be followed by Tracy Shandor. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, Tim, if you have the slides back up. Okay. Um, so as mentioned, um, you know, this is an exciting first new building for this project. Uh, it is five floors, 189 residential units that uh, reside on block three. Um, as Sean highlighted, I think we've hit many of the uh, sustainability goals that were outlined in the, the plan development process, um, including being ready for uh, the addition of solar panels if, if possible as well as uh, provisions in the infrastructure for uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, I think we're very excited about bringing this project to Madison and uh, think that aesthetically it is kind of a, a leading design in this area 
and uh, will set the tone for the rest of the development in the Madison Yards uh, development. So um, with that, I, I respect your time this evening and would be happy to answer any questions that the city council may have regarding the architecture. Thank you. Our next registrant is Tracy Shandor of Atlanta in support wishing to speak. Hi again. Um, I'll just be real quick again with the TDMP. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. I did also want to point out, um, I, gosh, I should have written it down. I was about to write it down and so I wouldn't forget. Um, I, I'll, I'm just here. I'm happy to answer any questions if, if they come up. Thank you. Thank you. We also have Sean Zimney of Chicago in support, available to answer questions from Gilbane Development, and Kevin Yaska of Verona in support, available to answer questions of JSD Professional Services. Are there questions for any of our registrants? Seeing none, um, we will close that public hearing and uh, Alder, oop, uh, Alder Carter, a uh, motion. You're still muted, Alder Carter. Move item 860243. Recommendation to council is to adopt with conditions. Thank you, Vice President Abbas. Second to adopt with condition. Moved and seconded to adopt with conditions. Alder Martin. Thank you. Um, I would like to move an uh, an alternate to the conditions or uh, a substitute. Yes, an amendment. amendment. <laughs> <laughs> what a long day, you guys. Um, an amendment for the uh, same condition as the previous one, um, taking out the 40000 and the doubling um, because of uh, the same reasons as before. I don't think that we have a plan in place, and I would rather we come up with the plans for um, a, a TDM ordinance um, rather than just make it up on the fly as it as it's kind of seemed it was um, at the plan commission. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Tierney, is that a second? That is a second, yeah. All right, Thank so you. it has been moved and seconded. Uh, Alder Martin, anything additional? Nope, that's it. Thank you, Alder. Is there any discussion on the motion, Alder Rummel? Could we add both amendments and just get it done in one fell swoop? Would that be friendly to the maker? Is there any objection to uh, adding Alder Rummel's amendment um, to the motion that is before us right now? Alder Kemble, is that an objection? That's an objection. All right, Alder Rummel, we'll take them separately. And so on uh, Alder Martin's amendment to remove the uh, requirement for 40,000 and the doubling is their objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of the amendment. Alder Kemble, request for a roll call. Yes. Thank you, Alder. All right, so uh, you've heard the amendment. All those in favor, aye. Those opposed, no as your name is called, and I will unmute you all, and the clerk will call the roll. Alder Heck? Aye. Aye, Hennick? No. No, Kemble? No. No, Lemmer? Aye. Aye, Martin? Aye. Aye, Moreland? Aye. Aye, Presta Giacomo? No. Sorry, I didn't catch that. No. No. Rummel? Aye. Aye. Skidmore? Aye. Aye. Tierney? Aye. Aye. Verveer? Aye. Aye. Abbas? Aye. Aye. Um, Alboras, I think he's left. Um, Balde? Balde? Aye. I don't know why you're not hearing me, but I'm saying. I'm sorry, hi. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> Bidar? Hi. 
Aye. Carter? Carter? Muted. Aye. Aye. Evers? Aye. Aye. Foster? Aye. Aye. Furman? Aye. Aye. Harrington McKinney? Aye. Aye. Uh, three no's and 16 ayes. With 16 ayes, the amendment passes. I will remute you all. And we'll go back to Alder Rummel. Thank you. I'd like to move the same amendment I made before to change um, conditional use number 34 in the June 29th addendum to add to that last second to last sentence. And the mode share survey shall be presented on an annual basis to the Transportation Policy Planning Board. Alder Lemmer, is that a second? A second. All right, so moved and seconded. Alder Rummel, do you wish to speak to it? Same rationale, have a, our committee look at it to make sure we're keeping an eye on things in addition to staff. All right, thank you, Alder. All right, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of Alder Rummel's amendment? Seeing none, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of Alder Rummel's amendment, which brings us back to the main motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of the main motion, uh, which is to grant with conditions as amended? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of granting with conditions as amended. That will bring us to the report of the Alcohol License Review Committee and item number nine, Legistar 60705, which is a public hearing for a new license for Tuto Pasta on State Street. Um, we do not have uh, so I'll open that public hearing. We have no registrants on item number nine. So for a motion, President Carter, you need to unmute yourself, President Carter. Yes, move item nine, Legislature 60705. Recommend to council with conditions. Second to grant with conditions. Moved and seconded to grant with conditions. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of granting with conditions? Seeing no objection, that item is granted. It will take us to item number 10, Legislature 60706, a public hearing for a new license for Chen's Dumpling House. We will open that public hearing. We have no registrants. It will close that public hearing, Alder Carter. <clears throat> yes, item 10, Legistar 60706, recommend to council to grant with conditions. Second to grant with conditions. Moved and seconded to grant with conditions. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of granting with conditions? Seeing no objection, that item is granted with conditions. That brings us to number 11, Legistar 60708, public hearing for a new license at RNF LLC. We will open that public hearing. There are no registrants. We will close that public hearing. Alder Carter. Legislature 60708, item 11, recommend, uh, recommend to council to grant with conditions. Second to grant with conditions. Moved and seconded to grant with conditions. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, that item is granted. Brings us to item number 12, public hearing uh, for a new license of Taco Local. Uh, we will open that public hearing. We have no registrants. We will close that public hearing. President Carter. Move item 12, Legislature 60709, recommend to council to grant with conditions. Second to grant with conditions. Moved and seconded to grant with conditions. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing none, that item is granted with conditions. That is the end of our public hearings. 
So we will move on to the excluded items, starting with number 13. And we have a number of registrants on item 13, starting with Susan Schmitz of Marinette Trail in support, wishing to speak to be followed by Alexandra. Susan is not in the attendee list. All right. Is Alexandra of Gorham Street in opposition wishing to speak? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, yes, I would like to speak. I'm speaking in opposition. As I'm uh, not positive, however, I, I believe there's surveillance included in this $500,000. And I would, uh, that's why I'm vehemently opposed. Because none of this money, if there's any money going into specifically very vague, language into surveillance. I work in digital marketing. I know a lot more about tech than, I mean, um, a lot of like actual people that work in government who are like older. Um, they like every single app that is, that is quote unquote free has at some point collected certain kinds of data. And even with, if it's in like a private network, there really is no good cyber security. There are not very good cyber security capabilities. I mean, you see it all over the country throughout. I mean, country, like various countries being attacked, but not just that, like Target, like getting and various other, I've, <laughs> there was like a whole seeking arrangement scandal, some website, some online dating website, um, a whole bunch of data got leaked and there are lots of hackers that just, uh, they create viruses for fun. And like you, there are stuff on like Reddit message boards and other for anonymous forums um, that about people who talk about, cause uh, th they can see how far a virus goes and it's like a game for them. And so that really makes uh, all that technology, um, the, the current capability, makes that entirely dangerous, not even mentioning um, any privacy concerns. That's all I have to say. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Jessica Dye of State Street in support wishing to speak. To be followed um, by Tiffany Kenny. We have no Jessica Dye or Tiffany Kenny. Uh, all right. Then our only other registrant um, Available to answer questions is Jill Annis of Berkeley Drive. Are there any questions for any of our registrants? Seeing none, uh, Alder Carter, a motion on item 13? Yes, move item 61060. Second. I believe the the motion uh, suggested on the consent agenda was referral. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. Referral to EDC on July 15th, finance on July 20th, and common council on July 21st. Second. Thank you. So move to refer. Is there any discussion? Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of referral? Seeing none, that item is referred. And that will take us to item number 17. Um, just give me a sec to refresh the registration report. We have a number of registrants on this item as well, starting with Matthew Rock of Butler Street in opposition wishing to speak to be followed by Gisela Wilson. Hi. Uh, uh, this agenda item is focused on creating additional levels of bureaucracy over the Civilian Oversight Board to delay and undo existing work. I know because I pull the same trick at work when I don't wanna do something. The Civilian Oversight Board is already contacting community organizations as well as working on how they would fit into the existing Madison government structure to pause, to pause these ongoing efforts for up to six months while another group weighs in is unnecessary. Finally, 
quote, reviewing city policies and offering recommendations on areas that impact the quality of life of African Americans in the city of Madison, unquote, should be an ongoing process by all committees instead of the res responsibility of one for six months. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Gazelle Wilson of Morrison Court in opposition wishing to speak to be followed by Veronica Figueroa Velez. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello. Um, I'm speaking today in opposition to resolution 61015. And I believe it's seductively titled President's Task Force on Critical Issues Affecting the Black Community. And while I'm really supportive of item number two of the re resolution, I strongly oppose items one and three because they already, they undermine work already being done and that has already been done by the Alder Work Group and by the MPD Policy and Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. The MPD Policy and Procedure Ad Hoc Committee specifically designed a police oversight mechanism that would provide a means of redress to underserved people in the community. The concerns issues and needs of individuals and communities that come into contact with the police the most traditionally go unheard. In order to prevent the extreme harms that tend to occur as a result of contact with the police, contact that often is a result of society's own shortfalls in care, the mechanism of oversight as designed in the report is needed to address the dramatic power imbalances that exist. Um, in sum, in addition to being duplicative of work being done by the Alder Work Group, items number one and three of the resolution and the suggested composition of the task force failed to take into account the complexities of these issues. Some of the organizations named take a more assimilationist approach to white supremacist patriarchal capitalism um, and that risks administrative capture of oversight since some of the people we're talking about can't or don't have the opportunity to assimilate even if they tried. These issues aren't reducible to anti-blackness. Though racism is a critical component, it's not the only variable that needs to be considered and unfortunately, that's what the resolution suggests. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Veronica Figueroa Velez of School Road in opposition wishing to speak to be followed by Gregory Golombiak. Uh, Veronica is not in the list, but Gregory is. Right, so Gregory Golombiak of Jennifer Street, neither supporting nor opposing wishing to speak to be followed by Aaron Lopez. I'm a former member of the MPD Policy and Procedure Review Ad Hoc Committee. I'm requesting that Alders amend the President's Task Force Resolution to remove items one and three. As currently written, this resolution would derail the work expeditiously setting up the Independent Monitor and Civilian Oversight Board. It's duplicative and it would create a serious conflict of roles. Alder Carter released a statement that does not acknowledge and appears to entirely dismiss the major contributions of Black leaders um, to this process up to this point. The Ad Hoc Committee co-chair was Tom Brown of the Urban League. The Ad Hoc Committee appointees also included Jackie Hunt of Journey Mental Health, Nehemiah Justified Anger, Matthew Brongan, who was affiliated with YGB and United Way, Anthony Cooper, Director of Entry Services for Nehemiah, and Stephen Marsh, who was pastor at Lake Edge Lutheran Church and was affiliated with Madison Area Urban Ministry and NAACP. The Ad Hoc Committee worked to strongly engage with Madison's Black community and received extensive input, testimony, presentations, and guidance from an array of Black leaders and organizations. Individuals included Greg Jones, Dr. Floyd Rose, Dr. Ruben Anthony, Reverend Alex G, Bishop um, Harold Rayford, Michael Johnson, M. Adams, Brandy Grayson, Jacqueline Bojas, Norm Davis, Felicia Jones, Tori Petaway, and Walter Katz. And that's not an exhaustive list. I know I'm forgetting a number of individuals. Organizations included NAACP of Dade County, 100 Black Men, Sankofa Behavioral Services, Justified Anger, Nehemiah, Young, Gifted, and Black, Freedom, Inc., Gems Enterprises of Madison, Boys and Girls Club, United Way Coalition, and the City of Madison Department of Civil Rights. Separate from these lists, many Black residents attended various of our meetings and provided public comment or emailed the committee. An OER group worked hard to reach out to and receive input from Black residents. In addition to OER outreach to many Black leaders, there were listening sessions with Freedom Inc., Jerome Flowers, listening session with community members at Christ the Solid Rock Baptist Church, 10 Black mothers, including um, Corinda Rainey Moore, Jackie Hunt, etc. 
Sherry Carter's statement issued today appears to dismiss all of that prior input and guidance from Black community members, organizations. I'll also note Alder Carter and Alder Skidmore were the only two alders who did not vote in favor of accepting the ad hoc committee report. And that position seems at odds with all Black, black residents I've heard from. Alder McKinney, who would be on Alder Carter's task force, is the only alder, along with Alder Skidmore, who voted against creation of an independent monitor civilian oversight board, opposing adoption of the ad hoc committee subreport committing the city to that. Alder McKinney also introduced an amendment to strip out all funding from the for the independent monitor in the 2020 operating budget. I'll also note that it's interesting that the list of organizations for inclusion on the task force listed in the text of the resolution do not include Black-led groups that have been advocating for strong oversight and community control. Freedom Inc., Urban Triage are not included, and EMI Justified in Anger is not included. Um, I'll also add that the task force is labeled exclusively about critical issues facing the Black community, but the ad hoc committee report recommends that groups nominating oversight board members be, quote, community-based organizations that have an interest in civil rights, immigrant rights, disability rights, mental health, racial equity, and social justice, end quote. It also specifies that a diversity of communities be represented, Black, Latinx, Native American, LGBTQ, organizations in the field of mental health, youth advocacy, and AODA, et cetera. So an array of areas of focus and an array of marginalized communities for a task force that's stated to be only about issues facing the Black community, which is an absolutely critical marginalized community, but only one, to select all the organizations that would submit nominations to the Oversight Board and to oversee the timeline process for proposals and action items that relate to the Oversight Board and Independent Monitor as a whole seems to make little sense. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Aaron Lopez of Franklin Street in opposition wishing to speak to be followed by Amelia Royko Mara. Hello. Go ahead, Aaron. Hi, I just have a quick history lesson for people who still think this is something radical. Before 1967, there were no public ambulance services. If anyone ever needed emergency medical assistance, they'd have to call the morgue or the police to drive them to the hospital because that's all they had with lights and sirens. But on 1967, the year after the National Academy of Sciences published a white paper in which they showed that system was causing 50,000 needless deaths every year, the former mayor of Pittsburgh, then also former mayor of Pennsylvania, died in a police vehicle on its way to the hospital. The city was forced to rethink its policies and eventually the whole country followed suit. The thing is, 1967 may have been the birth of America's public EMT services, but for years they had already been volunteer EMTs called Freedom House Ambulance Service. They were born from the civil rights movement, operated by black street medics serving black neighborhoods because most of the time, hearses and police vehicles just didn't show up to emergencies or protests there. And when they did, they only made it worse. They'd been asking for refund for years, but they only got it after an important politician died because police weren't equipped for those emergencies. Today, we take EMTs for granted and can't imagine a world without them. What will we take for granted 60 years from now? Uh, something we don't even have a word for. They didn't have a word for that back then. If not any regular neighborhood Madisonian, who exactly has to die at the hands of police before we can act on this? before we can act on all the black, brown, and trans experiences and research publications that show cops are killing us and costing society. Uh, that's all I have to say. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Amelia Rocco Mara of Arena, Wisconsin, in opposition wishing to speak to be followed by Shadira Kilfai Flores. Uh, looks like she dropped out of the queue. All right. Do we have Shadira Kelfi Flores of Wilson Street in opposition wishing to speak? Yes. Shady, are you with us? She is unmuted. You may need to unmute on your end. I may have to try coming back to her. All right. So we'll go on to Nathan Reichomar of Arena, Wisconsin, in opposition, wishing to speak. Do we have Nathan? Yes, he's here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. We have an uh, unstable network out here, so I apologize if I'm breaking up. Um, Amelia, who, who does want to speak, was unable to connect, so we'll do our best. Dear members of the Madison Common Council on Mayor Rhodes Conway, I am urging you to oppose items one and three of resolution 61015. It does not do what it purports to do. When Alder 
President Carter introduced a proposed resolution in title only called President's Task Force to Address Issues That Affect the Black Community. One could be forgiven for believing something more substantial and important was soon to come that would fill out the resolution language with something appropriate to the title. Who could object to something with a title like that? But like the Trojan horse of ancient Greece, this resolution is not what it seems. Items one and three of the resolution are in fact specifically designed to undermine and negate the work of the Alder Work Group to develop logistics and operational details for MPD Independent Civilian Oversight, also known as the Alder Work Group. They are duplicative, and the title of the resolution would suggest that the Alder's interest is more narrow than the intentions of the ad hoc committee's more broader scope uh, and inclusive nature. This work group that so many folks wrote into you all in support of and believe are working hard to ensure a diverse group of the city's most marginalized members can participate in the critical work of the Civilian Oversight Board is in jeopardy of being rendered moot by the language of Resolution 61015. Item 1 would grant this new group the power to identify community organizations that would submit nominations for the COB, but the list of suggested groups reads <clears throat> like a who's who of the city's most well-funded nonprofit groups, not the less mainstream community groups fighting for greater community control of the police department. To install representatives of the organizations that already have cozy relationships with MPD that they doubtlessly want to protect virtually guarantees the COB becomes a toothlessly compliant friend of the police. Item three outlines the power to create a timeline, processes, process for proposals, and action items that relate to the COB and independent monitor. This is entirely duplicative of the Alder Work Group and seems like a clear play to compete directly with whatever the outcome of the Alder Work Group is. The fundamental problem with all of this is that Alder President Carter, Alder Harrington McKinney, typically along with Alder Skidmore, have with their voting record proven their staunch opposition to anything that would enable strong civilian oversight of the police, that would consider restricting their access to taxpayer dollars, that would limit their power in any way. And they want to be in charge of establishing the makeup and powers of the Civilian Oversight Board and the Independent Monitor. Why not just let MPD decide how this all goes? I don't really believe Alder President Carter's issue is that the Alder Work Group isn't diverse enough, which has been offered as a complaint. It's that she and Alder Harrington McKinney want the power to advance MPD's agenda, which is to gut civilian oversight. Again, the organizations listed for inclusion in their president's task force deliberately exclude key black-led groups, pushing hardest for changes in policing and for strong oversight, including community control. This is a naked power play that will end in the kneecapping of what could be one of the most progressive and powerful police oversight mechanisms in the entire country. Please don't let that play succeed. Thank you. And uh, Amelia is back. All right. Um We'll go back to Amelia Royko Mar of Arena, Wisconsin, in opposition, wishing to speak. Thank Amelia, you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm speaking in opposition. Um, I'd like to bring attention to uh, a, a few votes to begin with. Um, on January twenty first, twenty twenty. Uh, Alder President Sherry Carter did not vote in favor of accepting the 177 recommendations of the ad hoc committee. She was the only Alder besides Paul Skidmore who did not vote in favor. Uh, one of the other members of her proposed president's work group, Barbara McKinney, was one of the only two Alders who voted against the creation of an independent monitor and civilian oversight board on August 6th of 2019. Alder McKinney, Alder Harrington McKinney has voted <laughs> against just about every single p item that has come before her for civilian oversight and police accountability. And Alder uh, Carter is j right behind her on that. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that they need to think otherwise. I'm just suggesting that there is, there is if, if there really is truly a desire to respect the work of the ad hoc group and a desire for to build the public's trust then we can't have people routinely trying to cut this effort off at the knees using all different kinds of angles. And then, of course, this one is, you know, it's set up to make anyone who opposes it look, look terrible. So I'm opposed to item one and I'm opposed to item three because it's just redundant. There, you have had ad hoc who are... Uh, which is an incredibly diverse group, not to mention so many people. And, uh, and I'll send you all the list of the people and organizations that were interviewed, contributed guidance, presentations, and recommendations over the four years, something Alder Carter would know had she attended a few meetings of ad hoc. Um, there's been, it's been such a beautiful process. 
And so to, to then have to have this all go through review again, just so they can cut it off the knees, is just, I mean, it's, it's so, like, it's such a time waste. Everybody's just trying to stay healthy right now and find a way to make money. And, and, and we have to worry about constantly protecting this effort to have meaningful civilian oversight of the police department in a place that is considered the worst place in America to raise the black child. So I'm asking you to vote down number one and vote down item number three. And please watch your email in the next few minutes. I'm gonna send you the list of all the people that made very meaningful contributions, including the task force, the NAACP and law, law enforcement and leaders of color collaboration task force that submitted a bunch of recommendations. I was on that group, submitted a bunch of recommendations to this report and a whole bunch of them were accepted. So there's a significant contribution of people who are part of the Black Leadership Council to this. Any indication of otherwise is just not the truth. There has to be some cap on how a process is just to say, let's be honest. Let's be honest about what this really is. This is another effort to, to, to stop meaningful civilian oversight, an effort to police, to please the police department. Uh, so please vote down um, item one and three. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Joe, do we have Shady Kilfoy Flores with us still? Uh, she's still in the attendee list. Um, there is no M. Adams, though, but uh, we do have, uh, I must pronounce that wrong. Kajua? Yes, Kajua. All right. Um, uh, just pause. Alder Balde, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, so I was going to make an amendment if this is the right time to do it. Not yet. We still have a, a few folks um, in wishing to speak. All right, so just remember, uh, once they speak, I'll I, make I won't take your uh, hand down, Alder. <laughs> I, uh, I think uh, M was before me. M is on. Uh, so we're, uh, let's let's try for Shady one more time and see if she can unmute herself. Shady, are you with us? Maybe a prompt on your screen. All right. And then do we have M. Adams of Churchill Drive? Uh, yes, either M is on. I don't see her on the attendee list. Is she under a different name? Um, There's two people listed as Freedom Inc. I don't know who they are. M, M is probably the first one, and then I'm the second one. Well, you're listed by your name, so that's okay. Then you're M easy to find. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's try the one or more of the Freedom Inc. folks. Okay. M is. Are you there? May I try both of them, Joe. Might have a prompt on your screen asking to be unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, I got two of them up. Let me close the one that's, I think, is that going. And so this is M. Adams of Churchill Drive, neither in opposition nor support, wishing to speak, to be followed by Kajua Vaj. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, excellent. Uh, hey, everybody, M. Adams here. So I am speaking against... Uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, number one and number three, and in support of a of the creation of a black, I don't know what it's called, a black committee or a black work group. Um, I am against one and three for several reasons. One, I want to point to the fact that, um, you know, black folks, we have been organizing on this issue for the last six years. I myself have put in thousands of hours, not including my staff, not including the hundreds, maybe even thousands at this point of black folks we've directly engaged on this issue. 
and the black folks that we are engaging are survivors of gender-based violence. They're black women and girls, they're black LGBTQI people, they're people who traditionally are left out side of the conversations around police. So uh, for the argument to be that there was no black folks involved in this, I think just really erases the work that we've been doing over the last five or six years. I do think it's important for more black people to get into it and we look forward to that. We have always said black folks come to the table around this. We have always called on the leadership or, or the, the work of other black people to join us in this fight. Um, and so we still have an invitation to do that and we wanna be in lockstep with our community, but to block the progress of work done by black leadership on the ground. And by the way, I think, I mean, just to speak contemporarily, I think organizations like NAACP, Urban League, et cetera, are really important. But what we know in the last 10 years, they're not at the forefront of this movement. Um, it's organizations like Freedom Inc., Urban Triage, nationally, it's organizations in, inside of the movement for black lives that has not been um, NAACP, Urban Leagues and other folks. So I think in order to really be in lockstep with this movement moment, and this is why we're having this conversation because of on the ground organizing led by Black folks, Black women and girls, Black queer trans intersex folks who've been putting our bodies on the line to advance this issue. And not only are we frontline workers in terms of protest work and also respect, re responding to harm and violence inside of our communities, we're also the thought leaders and experts on these issues. I literally just got off the phone a few hours ago with Angela Davis discussing police issues. So in terms of just being an expert, I think it, I mean, it, it feels like our work is just completely overlooked. And so yes, we had a conversation a few days ago, but it was not presented to us that there was going to be a recommendation to take away the, the aspects that I'm not, that I'm opposing here today. And so again, I think that many of us have been on the front line. I, at this point, I can confidently say we've engaged thousands of black people in this city on policing. And I don't think there's another organization that can say that. And so I do think you should invite them in, but to, to halt the work of thousands of black people who've put in thousands upon thousands of hours um, to make this structure just does not seem right. So it is not that we have not been engaged. It is that we have not had the access ourselves, perhaps, to make this committee or body that you can make, which I think you should still make it, but not at the expense of, uh, of stopping the pro progress of the work that we're doing now. And again, I think the people that we really need to be censoring have been the people who've been advancing this work on the ground, continuing to advance this work. And what, the other thing that I'll point to is I really wanna disrupt the dynamic that happens. We also know that throughout the years, there have been black leadership meetings that have excluded us, that have not brought in Freedom Inc., that have not brought in Urban Triage, that have not brought in the thousands of people who've been in the streets and in meetings and so on and so forth without us. And so what we do not want is just a replication of the grass tops of people making decisions, but who are not the ones putting in the work and who are not the experts of policing. And I wanna be really clear, we're policing experts in addition to being survivors. And so um, against number one, against number three, and in support of the creation of the committee, but not as a way of determining or stopping the progress of the working groups. And again, I wanna be part of, we wanna be part of whatever the committee is that's developed, that's taking serious um, the issues impacting the black community. Thank you. Next is Kajwa Vaj of Grandview Boulevard, neither supporting nor opposing, wishing to speak. Yes, am I on? You are, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we're in a historic moment right now. And so I am in full support of creating a black task force. I think that every community has the right to look at policies and resources and agendas that impact their communities. And so I think that if this task force is going to do that, um, I'm in full support of that. But what I do want to recommend is that we do not continue to uplift and include leaders um, that everybody thinks is a leader and leave out queer and femme and young people. And so that's one of my push um, so that other po folks like Freedom Inc's queer, young, femme, um, GNC folks can also be part of that leadership. And I agree with them. I think that over the years when uh, Black leadership has been called uh, by the city um, or by anyone, um, it's typically excluded uh, queer leadership. And so I don't think that we can continue to have any kind of uh, Black leadership task force or Hmong or any uh, race uh, without including femme and queer folks. Um, I also agree with them. And I think that, you know, this is something that we've been fighting for so long. Um, 
And I'm a little bit confused because I hear a lot of people saying that the, the black task force is going to impede or, or stop um, the progress uh, of the um, police oversight board and um, the individual I think independent investigator. And so I want some clarity around that because I think that there's lots of mixed mes messages. And so we don't want to impede and we don't want to stop that. Um, and so later somebody can address that. I think that's really important. Um, but again, I think that it's important that, um, especially an, as a non-black person, um, I've really been thinking about this all day. Um, I definitely and have been building and, and as somebody who's been building power and community with black folks through my work at Freedom Inc. I think that it's important um, that black people have their own space, have their own say. And um, I've been hearing people say, you know, like, do we wait another six months for something, um, especially around number one and number three? And I say maybe not um, because a lot of work has been put into that. But every issue that impacts Black people, they have the right to review it. They have the right to pull in more um, voices. But at the same time, I think that it's important to also not uh, erase the work that Black queer femme and uh, folks who have been doing this work for so long. And so um, I am in support of the creating a Black task force to look at issues impacting the community. And I'm not in support of um, anything that's going to impede progress or things that we've been working on for a long time. But at the same time, um, I'm not black. And so I've been thinking a, a lot about like, how do I be pro-black, um, also not be anti-black, but at the same time that um, freedom is on the line. And um, if uh, these were Hmong leaders who were putting something out um, and it wasn't in line with me reaching my freedom or fighting for my freedom, I think I would have to say something about that. And so I just want to say maybe this is a historical moment in all the people who've not voted uh, to police accountability and to defunding police. This might be the moment and this is the time. But um, I think that it's this um, question and this, this issue is best addressed, whether or, or not I like it um, by Black folks because they're the most impacted and so I just want people to be mindful as we're thinking about this as non-Black people to also keep in mind um, that, yes, we put in a lot of work, but it's impacted our communities differently. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, we also have registrations from Rainbow Marifrog of Mullen Street in opposition available to answer questions. David Riss Miller of Sawmill Road in opposition, available to answer questions. Peter Lawrence Worley of Cross Street, in opposition, available to answer questions. And Zaya Hartman Semptry of Mary Street, um, of it, in opposition, available to answer questions. Are there questions for any of our registrants? Seeing none, I should say we also have a number of other registrants and I hope staff will share the full list with the council. Um, and it's a too large a number to read through all of the names individually. Um, so we need a motion uh, on the floor before we can amend. So um, President Carter, a motion? I move item 17-61015 um, to be approved. Vice President Abbas? Second. Moved and seconded to approve Alder Balde. I would like to make an amendment on the number one and number three. Uh, so I would amend that item number one, uh, read as follows. Uh, reach out to African-American groups and community leaders for the uh, purpose of discussing police reform. And then item number three, uh, to read as create a timeline, process or proposal and action item that relates to police reform and other policies coming before the Common Council, where the African-American voice need to be elevated as the population that is most impacted. So I think if I can speak to the amendment now. Uh, we'll need a second first, Alder. Is there a second? I will second. 
Thank you. And uh, Alder Baldai, do you want to wish to speak? Yes. So obviously, I would have given uh, Alder Serikada uh, the benefit of the doubt. I sincerely believe that this is a work group that is from the bottom of her heart. Uh, it does happen that uh, these two groups, which is the uh, civilian oversight and the independent monitor, uh, you know, infuse into this, and therefore it has foggy people's uh, 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 believing in that uh, this is just for uh, an opportunity for people of color, particularly black people, to have a space and talk about what is happening and what they think should happen in order to help address some of these problems. So I think uh, this addresses the concern, at least from uh, the perspective of the, uh, uh, the registrant who spoke against item uh, one and three. Uh, I think uh, they also alluded to the fact that this is in fact uh, overdue, that we need to have a committee like this, where black people come together and talk about their issues and if possible recommend to council or our leaders uh, as to what they think can address this. Reality is these people live this life. Me and you can never understand the extent to which they are feeling some of this stuff. And so giving them a space, in my opinion, to have this discussion, I think is important. Uh, M said uh, during uh, her testimony that they've been working this for a very long time now. Uh, but who was there with them? Who was there with them? And so it is important, I think, uh, to move forward this work group. Uh, I think uh, we should not forget it with the oversight uh, uh, and uh, the civilian oversight and also the independent monitor. And I think this amendment will, will, will definitely separate it to 100%. So I hope everybody will find uh, the uh, time to uh, support this or uh, at least uh, move forward the, the, the president's work group as it is amended. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I must apologize to the council because I've had some great challenges technically um, this afternoon. I uh, want to uh, and thank you, Alder Balday, for offering up the amendment. And I um, uh, wholeheartedly support this. And um, I emailed um, uh, my comments and I want to, but I want to read them into the record because I want not only the council to, um, to have retrospect, but I also want those who uh, spoke in opposition. Uh, to all alders, July the 14th, Resolution 61015. Many of you have seen the movements welling up all over the city, anger, frustration, resolve, and determination and demand for change. These demonstrations, not only in Madison, but mobilize reactions across the country at the killing of George Floyd. The night that Tony Robinson was killed, I had just returned from St. Louis, specifically revisiting Ferguson, Missouri, at the very spot where he was killed. What happened after Ferguson? The city of Ferguson elected the first woman and the first African-American as mayor. Regardless of the negative picture that has been painted of me, I have and will always stand up for issues that are important and the restorative practices of how do we hear all voices and repair the harm. I will also always challenge systems that keep in place the inequities that have been voiced. Oops, let me be patient with me, I'm trying to have been voiced by so many. I have no personal agenda. I acknowledge that the root causes of injustices live. There is unsettling tension, but I am willing to sit with the tension and be willing to have any difficult conversations. The resolution number 61015 was not intended to undermine the Civilian Oversight Initiative. That is an untruth of the resolution's intent or design. This resolution is not intended to dilute or disrupt the work of the Alder Work Group in any way. That is also an untruth. This resolution, as intended, is convening a black, 
is the convening of black organizations and leaders to come together to promote black issues and to discuss matters that affect the black community. The task force is an intentional forum where the opportunity and the agenda is undiluted and unapologetically provides the opportunity. Oops. I just lost it. Um, this resolution was intended uh, as follows is governing is convening the black organizations and leaders to come together to promote black issues and to discuss matters that affect the black community. The task force is an intentional forum where the opportunity and the agenda is undiluted and unapologetically provides the opportunity to express black voices collectively when there is a need to move issues forward or speak out against uh, against or stop initiatives that negatively impact the black community. The intent of the president's task force is to bring together the black leadership, convene black organizations and leaders of the black community. There is a black chamber of commerce. There is a Latino chamber of commerce and there is a Madison chamber of commerce. We acknowledge the inequities that persist in Dane County at alarming rates. In 2018, the United Way released a new five-year plan. While Dane County is open, openly cited as one of the nation's best places to live, it is well documented that significant and social economic inequities exist in almost every indicator of well-being for people of color. From the United Way report, throughout history, public policies have disadvantaged communities of color across multiple generations. The task force will make clear that the road to reducing racial and structural inequities in Dane County requires policy actions and system changes that disaggregates and targets the root causes of the underlying drivers of community conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. The policy priorities set out by United Way, Dane County in 2020 were education, financial stability, health, and nonprofit and community strengthening. Disaggregate means to divide into constituent parts, to break up or to break apart. The intent of the president's task force on critical issues that impact African, African Americans is to intentionally break up and analytically disassemble all categories which have been aggregated or lumped together by many good intentioned folks that spoke against the resolution. The many untruths that have been generated and by the intensive noise around this resolution is intended to cloud one truth. Had Sherry Carter not been elected president, this tremendous body of work that was shifted under the three member alder work group would have been under the common council executive committee. Two of the supporting alders are on the executive committee. This body of work again would have been under the president's work group. I strongly believe that had, all, had another alder been elected president of the Madison common council and thus president of the common council executive committee or president and vice president of boss has selected different alders to the executive committee we would not be at this divisive place i want to call out that the noise was created as a cover-up of the underlying issue here it is an untruth that i am not against needed reform 
it is an untruth that I have not supported the work of the OIR report, the ad hoc committee, or the recommendations and work thereof. Because I have challenged the lack of transparency as it relates to processes surrounding this work, we have been maligned. I have the right to have questions asked and answered. Why must there be untrue attacks leveled against the intent of the resolution? Does racial equity exist only as long as one is in, a, in agreement with the majority? Does police reform need to happen? Of course it does. Are all police on the ilk of the officers in George Floyd's uh, death? One officer had more than 13 complaints. One had seven complaints. Do I support defunding the police and take the police budget down to zero? I cannot support that. Do we need to redirect city dollars to provide community resources where all thrive, where all citizens thrive? Of course we do. The president's task force on critical issues that impact the black community is absolutely necessary. The noise generated by the false narrative that we are not supportive of a new Madison, there, that, where, that is a lie. It shadows the question, why do we decide it is okay to change the playing field when there is black leadership? I have seen the members of the executive committee body come together in collaborative support when there was a less effective alder in the role of president. However, that has not been the case. The president has the authority to form the president's task force on critical issues that impact the black community. And I support the formation of the task force. It will be led by black community and chaired by black leaders. Many of the emails and public comments challenging our integrity have been fed untruths. We are not against the important work of the Alder Work Group. We are against the way by which that body was formed and lack of support afforded to Alder Carter. The Alder Committee is formed. Let it do its work and I respect its work, but let a community that has long taken a back seat to generously accept what is left over, have a voice to create their own table as well, define their own agenda and has the freedom to set a table that looks like them. It is very difficult for well-meaning folks to step back and allow a community that is most impacted by the policies and procedures voted on their behalf. The president's task force on critical issues that impact the black community should have a say in the matter. That concludes my, my report. And I urge the committee, I urge the, the council to vote in favor of the amendment that was lifted up by, um, uh, that was lifted up. Thank you, Alder. Alder Moreland. Um, thank you, Alder Harrington McKinney for that. Um, I, I wanna say a couple of things. First of all, uh, when we talk about divisiveness and not having all the voices at the table, um, this resolution came about with three black voices, three black people at the table to come up with the resolution. Me as the fourth alder was not even afforded the opportunity to have input. That's divisive. The work group, it has been said, like others have said, it's been, um, the people have been maligned that the alder work group was done under cloak of night. And I, I wanna clear the record. I was about to take my Saturday nap when I received a phone call to ask if I would do this. And being an elected official, when I'm asked, I do try to step up. I said, yes, that was that. There was no covert mission to do anything. Um, I would ask, however, I will state this, however, we have met, I believe, four times. And 
only two or three of the alders have joined those meetings and everyone is invited. And we've stated this several times and people have not been there. And we have reached out to the Urban League. We have reached out to Urban Triage. We have reached out to Freedom Inc. We have reached out with the organizations that were actively participating in the ad hoc um, committee working on the, the police structure. We've per I personally reached out to these groups and several people have attended. We had a Saturday 8.30 in the morning meeting and M. Adams was there. Greg Glimbeck was there. We've, we've had other meetings where people have been invited. So if, if you know, and, and I'm not, not easily offended. So when the resolution came out, I wholeheartedly agree that black folks need to be at the table working on black folks stuff. Wholeheartedly agree with that. But I think that we don't, we should not eliminate anybody from being at the table just because they don't have the title of a leader in the community. We should make it open. We should make sure that Freedom Inc. is there. Urban Triage is there. We should make sure that anybody in the African-American community can come to this table and not be made to feel as little because they don't have the title of a leader. These are the people that have been mostly affected by policing. Anybody that's interested in eliminating the systematic racism that's in Madison should be allowed to come to the table. But yes, our voices should be the loudest voices at that table. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, President Carter. Yes, um, just a couple things. When I walk into a room, who do you see? Do you think I'm from Sweden? Because when I walk into a room, it doesn't matter what I know, what I'm thinking, what my education is, you see a black person walking into a room. Let's not forget that. I had no idea that I was going to have to list every person, every organization in this city in this resolution. I have n I had no idea because even the Alder work group, which although yes, I want to be five members, it passed as three. That is fine. I said a few weeks ago that regardless of how we vote, we're supposed to support each other. This resolution had nothing to do with stopping the Alders work group from doing their job. In fact, they should do their job. That is their charge. But I also feel that my community needs a safe place to talk about whatever they want to talk about when it comes to policy. So I don't know if this is appropriate, but the mayor will tell me. I would like to change uh, where it's be finally resolved um, to African-American groups, community groups, and not list who I've listed. And the reason why I listed who I listed was because I was going out and I've been doing this, talking to different groups and getting the energy, the synergy in the community to come together for this task force. I remember that the Alders work group didn't list all the people they were gonna talk to, but yet they went out and talked to a whole lot of people. So I don't know why it was, um, used as a um, negative when I enlist everybody. But I, will, I want you to know that nobody is excluded from this task force. It is so important to provide people with a safe place. It is so important that Last year, when I was talking to a group of individuals, quite frankly, half of them had um, 
had been in prison. And I was talking to them about trying to expunge their record. They did not want to come to a big meeting to talk about their past. I believe in ex inclusion. And I think you know me as an honest person. So do I uh, am offended by anybody who tries, especially with my colleagues. Now the public can say what they want because they're going to. But when my colleagues instigate, navigate, and give a pathway to things that are not true, well, it just disappoints me. It disappoints me, and I can tell you this, it makes me see you in a whole different light. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. We need to practice what we preach. And one day, we will. But again, it's not today. So that is my amendment. I don't know if it is um, appropriate to throw that in there, but I do want to make it, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. So President Carter, we do have one amendment on the floor already um, that we'll need to dispense with before we can oh. come to yours. Okay, um, I'm sorry. But Alder Balde, uh, so I'm okay for that to be a friendly amendment if that would make it be part of my amendment. All right. So is there objection from the body to including President Carter's amendment with Alder Balde's amendment and taking it up all at once? I'm not seeing any objection to that. So um, just to be clear, um, there is both the language change from Alder Balde um, and then uh, removing references to specific groups from Alder Carter, and that's the amendment that's before us. Um, all right, so uh, Alder Carter, anything else? No, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, Alder Harrington McKinney. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, uh, Alder Moreland, I'm, I'm appreciative of your comments, and I have purposely not been around that table because I did not want the impression of those statements that were generated against me to hold up the work that you were, being, you were doing. Um, that's not going to happen. I am going to be at the table. I am going to participate. And I am going to support because that is exactly what the democratic process is. And so as alders get, get ready to, to make their vote, whether supportive or not, just really keep in mind is that those who, and Kajua said it in a most eloquent way in terms of understanding there is a difference about how things are perceived if you sit in our skin and how things are not perceived if you don't sit in our skin. So I would hope that the alders in casting their vote agrees to the fact that, that the, the black community has the right to sit in a space and talk about what impacts them whatever that is, they are afforded a space. And I would hope that you would be able to support that amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster. Thank you. Um, I was just gonna ask Alder Balde if he has the amendment language um, available that he could send uh, over email, or if not, then maybe just restating it, but I had a hard time following it. I want to make sure I'm understanding what it is. And then I also had a question for uh, the city attorney related to the, well, I guess first my question is to the sponsors regarding the uh, membership. 
Um, it seems like the, the membership is not uh, finally stated in the resolution. And I guess I'm wondering is the intent, since it's um, called a president's work group, is the intent that the appointments would be made by the council president? And if so, does that need to be in the resolution? Because I think otherwise, um, if it's not stated, I think appointments would happen by the mayor. So maybe just clarification from the sponsors about the intent and then if there's any um, advice from the city attorney. Thank you, Alder Foster. So let's start, uh, President Carter, with you, the intent on the membership of the body. Yes, yeah, so the intent on the membership, I was going to come back with um, names to be added to the resolution. Um, so at the next, I'm sorry, at the next um, council meeting. So, Alder, it's your intent that the the uh, members of the body would be appointed by the council president and, and confirmed by the council? Correct. And so, uh, Attorney Haas, um, I'm going to uh, unmute you, perhaps. Um, I believe that uh, Alder Foster is correct that that should be reflected in the language of the resolution, that members will be appointed by the council president and confirmed by the council? I agree, yes. All right, so um, that's the answer to Alder Foster's question. Um, Alder Balde, will you restate your portion of the amendment before us? And I remind Alders just in general, um, we need to email the clerk the language of our amendments. Um, so Alder Balde, if you can restate it and also share via email if you're able. So I will I'll type it up. Uh, uh, I didn't, uh, Alder Foster, I don't have it written, but I will type it up and say it, but I'll read it again. So on uh, number one, uh, that is completely going to go off. So it will read as follows. Reach out to African-American groups and community leaders for the purpose of discussing police mm -hmm. reform. So that's how number one is going to read. So number three uh, is going to be creating a timeline, creating a timeline, process, proposal, and action items that relate to uh, police reform and other policies coming before the Common Council, where the African-American voice needs to be uh, elevated as the population that is most impacted. So I will delete on that uh, civil, uh, uh, civilian oversight board, independent monitor, and uh, as well as. So I will type this soon and then uh, send it to uh, the clerk or to the all elders group. Thank you, Alder. And President Carter, do you want to just restate the, the portion that you wanted to amend? Yes, I didn't realize that he used African-American groups already. Um, be it finally resolved that members of the task force will include African American groups from the community that are mo most impacted by police practices and the task force will finish by December 30th. Thank you, Alders. Um, all right, so that's oh, the- and then what, I'm sorry, then what attorney Haas said. So let's let's deal with that second. I think we're stacking up a, <laughs> okay. a few things here. Um, so let's let's deal with that uh, amendment that's before us currently. Is there any further discussion on that amendment? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of that amendment? The changes to to number one, number three, and the final clause on um, removing specific groups. Seeing no objection, that amendment is adopted. And so now let's turn to the question of appointments. Um, uh, Attorney Haas, might you be able to suggest some language on that and where it should be inserted in the resolution for the elders? Well, I think just in the uh, yeah, for the resolved section, it could just state um, you know, that the members would be nominated by the 
council president and confirmed by the council. President Carter, a motion. I move approval. I move to grant, sorry. No, you're, you're moving that amendment. Yep. I'll second that. Uh, Alder Ball, they will second. Mm -hmm. So the amendment is to add a, and now therefore be it resolved clause that the appointments to the body will be made by the council president and confirmed by the council. And uh, Attorney Haas, perhaps you would write that and send it to the clerk. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote on the amendment? Seeing no objection, that amendment is adopted. Uh, and that brings us back to the main motion as amended. Is there any discussion on the main motion? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of the main motion? Seeing none, the main motion is adopted unanimously. And that will bring us to item number 64. And we have one registrant Jacob Harris of East Washington Ave in opposition, not wishing to speak. So uh, let's see, Vice President Abbas, I believe President Carter needed to step away for a minute. Would you make a motion on item 64, please? Sure. Let me quickly get on item 64 on the agenda item. Just one second. I file number 59192, creating section 8.24 of Medicine General Ordinance to ban alcohol from Reynold Park and the well property 24. Motion to recommend, uh, motion to adopt. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck, would you like to second that? Yes, second. Thank you, Alder Heck. Um, and then Alder Presta Giacomo, you asked for this to be separated do you wish to speak to it <clears throat> i guess i just have a question for staff just one go ahead alder um so yeah i guess i could just i mean i think it might be helpful to maybe have like the context explained so i, I don't know who would speak to that but if someone could like um maybe give a little, little bit of insight on the situation that's happening uh, so, uh, Mr. Knapp, uh, Park Superintendent, is here with us. Uh, Eric, would you like to speak to this? Um, certainly. So, um, the ordinance revision uh, before you is a permanent alcohol ban for Reynolds Park. Um, that was uh, moved forward by the Alder based on, we are now um, 2017, 18, and 19. Uh, or, I'm sorry, 2018, 19, and 20, we've issued uh, temporary bans. Uh, the Park Commission uh, has the ability to, well, I have the ability under Park Commission's authorization to issue a 90-day alcohol ban. Uh, we've done that each of the last three years based on uh, complaints, concerns, and demonstrated behavioral issues related to correlated to alcohol at this specific park. Um, Reynolds is a little unique in the fact that it's one of the very few downtown area parks that is not banned alcohol already under the ordinances. Um, so the, there have been a, a few issues. Um, we banned it temporarily each of the last three years. This is actually the second um, permanent ban that's went forward in my six years in this role. I'm generally fairly skeptical of them, uh, but we did um, we do have some pretty good data on the, the number of issues and the, the behavioral ban issues around Reynolds. And each of the last three years, um, there have been three behavioral bans for activities in Reynolds. All, all three each year are related to alcohol use. And that those equate to about 16% on average of the total park system behavioral bans. So it's become a significant resource um, issue. And what we find is after we get the temporary ban in place and after we do the education first um, conversations we have with our rangers and signage, those issues go back, go away. Uh, as far as behavioral issues that are 
um, causing the most concerns in the community and, and concerns with parks as well. Uh, those often relate to um, uh, verbally abusive and or uh, lodging the park and or um, sexual occurrences are, are the three most common over the last three years. But that's a general overview, but it's a, it's a tool that um, we use very sparingly. 20, 20, 29 parks currently have an alcohol ban of a 270 permanent alcohol ban. Um, we certainly are aware that it actually um, it does create challenges in, in managing the park, uh, but the rangers uh, themselves, the rangers feel that they support it. The, the neighbor association has supported it. Uh, they all their supports it. I'm often skeptical of permanent bans, but I do think in this this case we went through an iterative situation where the only park in that area that doesn't have a ban is Reynolds. And so when there's no ban in place, the issues gravitate and um, the, really amplify in one space that's relatively small that inhibits others' ability to use the park uh, positively. Thanks. That's all. Thank you, Alder. All right. So the motion is to adopt. Is, are there any further questions for staff or is there any discussion? Alder Kemble. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to relate a conversation that several of us alders had with um, North District Captain Brian Ackeret and uh, Beacon and Porchlight service providers around Warner Park around this very issue recently. I think it might illuminate um, some broader issues around the, you know this this idea of prohibition um, of alcohol and using using rangers and police to enforce. So at Morner Park at the shelter, there has typically been um, issues, police calls to that, that um, you know, the outdoor shelter in the summer for alcohol related uh, behavior. And, um, but this year, Captain Ackeret said has said that there have been very few, if any, um, police calls or issues around that shelter, and not because there aren't people drinking there. There are, but it's because the men's shelter is at the Warner Park Community Rec Center um, and has been since April, and there are outreach workers there every day, and those outreach workers. Um, typically go and walk around the park and talk to folks. Um, some of them are their guests in the shelter at night. Some of them aren't, but they're just building relationships with people and establishing trust with people who are there um, drinking and maybe um, engaging in behaviors that, or potentially engaging in behaviors that people might uh, call the police on. But because of their presence, uh, people are behaving in a, in a very different way this summer. And so there hasn't had to be police calls and there hasn't had to be uh, many. I mean, uh, Supervisor Knepp can, can maybe say if his rangers have been more or less active um, or, around that situation this summer, but they haven't. So for me, that just goes to show that um, our response to you know, what we call problem behaviors in the community um, a, a prohibition and punishment response doesn't make the behaviors really go away and doesn't address any of the underlying causes. And when we invest in outreach um, to people who are who have maybe in the past or whom people might fear engage in in uh, antisocial behaviors in public spaces. Um, that is mitigated a lot and relationships are made and connections are human connections are made and people, um, people behave better. So I just like us to, to think about that, especially as we're contemplating doing a different kind of emergency response system to people suffering um, mental health crises and drug and alcohol related crises. 
um, that it really works. And it's a lot less expensive than enforcement and using an, uh, an expensive police force to enforce on that. So, you know, these bans have typically, it was interesting um, to hear that that most of the parks downtown already have bans and that very few parks elsewhere do. And, and a lot of this I think has to do with um, the homeless population who have no place to drink indoors and, you know, tend to, and so they drink outside. Um, it was a big equity issue with the beer garden at old, at, at uh, Ulbrick park where alcohol was banned there. Um, for people who were, you know, drinking outside, but then for people who could pay, you know, $7 for a pretzel, you could drink there. So uh, we just need to think really carefully about how we're, um, the, the effects, the, the broadening social effects of these kind of bans and alternative ways of that we can invest in, um, you know, connecting with people and, and bringing a different kind of solution. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster. Thank you, Mira. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate Alder Campbell's comments. I would echo um, echo them, and you know, I, I I also know Alder Heck, and I know how much work he puts in as Alder, and has probably one of the most demanding constituencies uh, of any of us on the the council, and um, recognize. Um, that this is not something that I, I don't think he was supporting, you know, early on. And this has been, there have been ongoing issues with, I think, you know, apparently few um, alternatives to deal with the issues. And so I think, you know, here we are with the one tool in the toolbox that, um, you know, perhaps many of us would agree is not a, not a good one, but it really, to me, does in this time where we're, where we're, being so reflective about policing, where we're, we're talking about reforming what policing means. You know, to me, I, I've been trying to talk with my constituents about this because, yeah, you know, there's civilian oversight. That's a really important component. There's the question of how, you know, how much of our resources we're putting towards policing versus other things. But I think it also really just gets at the point of how do we solve our problems? And the idea that we, we pass a ban and then we ask police and park rangers to enforce that, you know, it's, as Alder Kemble said, it's really not dealing with the issue. And, you know, I, I do think that there's no question that this is, this is going to and does have a disparate impact on different members of the community. You know, my, when my son was still in uh, youth soccer, Ulrich was our, was his home field. And I remember very clearly having our end of the season, uh, you know, party for the kids and the parents and ordering pizza and people having their coolers with beer. And as, you know, largely uh, white people, I don't think any of us were afraid that we were going to come and get hassled uh, for having alcohol illegally in that in Old Brick Park at the time. But that's not true for everyone. And the fact that we have laws that are selectively enforced is incredibly problematic. And I think that's what this accounts to. I, I don't think there's any way around it. We know that people are gonna continue to do it and won't get hassled uh, unless they're doing something else that's wrong. And so to me, the idea of passing an alcohol ban so that we have that tool so that we can sort of get rid of folks um, that we think are gonna cause problems it's just, it's just not the answer. It's not the solution. And it's not something that I can support. So um, I, I, I definitely get the challenges that are there. But I think we have to force ourselves to, to actually work at addressing the problem. If there's alcohol abuse that's leading to other issues that are, that are impacting neighbors, that are impacting other users of the park, we should have the tools to deal with those at our disposal. And I don't believe we need to ban alcohol uh, from the park. The last thing I'll say is, you know, we don't know how long COVID is going to last and how long this need for physical distancing. And, you know, we've gone to great lengths and taking over some of our public right of way to, to make space for people to eat and drink outside. To me, going and getting takeout and going to a park to enjoy that when we have limited space to do that in our restaurants is something we should be promoting and encouraging. This should be public space that, that people can go 
and have picnics outside. And like it or not, drinking is a part of that culture for many, many people. And I don't think it's in our best interest to, to add more uh, parks and alcohol prohibitions in parks in, in a time when we really need to be finding other opportunities for people to stay outside and to stay safe and to stay away from each other. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I can't vote to support this, thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I do appreciate the points that have been brought up and I, I think they're quite valid. Uh, this situation at Reynolds Park is a little bit unique though. I think this, this park is surrounded by uh, residential properties and they effectively have no front yards. This, this is, I, I don't know if you've ever been there before, but it's, it's very densely packed there. This is a one block park, square park in probably the most densely packed uh, part of, of the of downtown area. And uh, they, so the, the impacts of uh, some behaviors that, that Supervisor Knapp described uh, is acute compared to some areas. And uh, it's as if it's in your front yard because people have no front yards. The park is their front yards and they, they don't own that property, but it is public space. And so for many of the hundreds of neighbors that live around here that, have, uh, that, that live directly around the park that have been asking for, for this ban, the, the impacts are, uh, I'll call them uncomfortable. Uh, it, it's also unique because uh, we do have uh, the Salvation Army and the Beacon within a block or two. And uh, I, I think that actually a fair number of the people that have been the biggest uh, problem behavior wise have not really been clients of the Beacon or the Salvation Army, from what I understand. And, you know, we, we've had these three years of temporary bans that Supervisor Nepp, uh mentioned, and there haven't been uh, arrests. The police and the Rangers haven't been arresting people. There's been a an educational period where the goal is to let people know that drinking isn't allowed. And that generally pretty much takes care of it. And uh, so I don't think there is over policing involved. Uh, it's, it's about a behavior change. And uh, certainly there's the whack-a-mole problem. If there are parks that are uh, still allowing alcohol you know, there is that problem. And I think that's something Alder Verveer and everybody can relate to in the downtown area that uh, there aren't enough serve, uh, uh, outreach workers to come to these people. I, I don't know as if there's ever been an outreach worker at Reynolds Park because there isn't the capacity, even though the beacon is so close, they're so busy uh, with their everyday uh, work that there, there really is no outreach. So until we ban alcohol in all parks or uh, allow alcohol in all parks or in all public spaces, I think we're stuck with this unfortunate piecemeal solution. So I'd ask your support. Thank you, Alder. If no other Alders in the queue wishing to discuss the motion uh, is to approve is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Uh, Alder Prestigiacomo, uh, is that request for a roll call? Yes. Yep. Thank you, Alder. All right. So the motion is to adopt um, all those in favor, aye. Those opposed, no. I will unmute you all, and the clerk will call the roll. Alder Heck? Aye. Aye. Hennick? Aye. Aye. Kemble? No. No. Lemmer? Aye. Aye. Martin? No. 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 I my item is most... Moreland? 
Aye. Aye. Pastor Giacomo? No. No. Rummel? Yes. Rummel? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch it. Yes. Yes, aye. Skidmore? Aye. Aye. Tierney? Aye. Aye. Verveer? Aye. Aye. Abbas? No. No. Alboris? Is no. on, I believe. Oh, you're here. Alboris? No. No. Balde? Aye. Aye. Bidar? No. No. Carter? Carter? Carter, you are muted. Abstain. Abstain. Evers? No. No. Foster? No. No. Furman? Aye. Aye. Harrington McKinney? Aye. Aye. Eight no's and 12 ayes. With 12 ayes, that item passes. I apologize. It's 11 ayes and one abstain. Uh, excuse me, with 11 eyes, that item passes. Um, and that brings us to item number 81. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, we did have three people um, register for item 70 after the consent agenda available to answer questions. However, they wanted to register for item 126, which is the geometry of Cedar Street and Park Street. And there seems to be some confusion on whether that is for referral or adoption tonight. Uh, all right. So item number 70 oh, was adopted. Table. Excuse me. Um, let me remute everyone. Um, so item number 70 was adopted on the consent agenda. And um, Joe, what's the other item number? Um, they actually wish to speak on item uh, 126, I believe. Uh, 127, which is the geometry of Cedar Street. And so Street. item 127 is for introduction. Um, uh, that's introduction of new business for referral without debate. Um, and that item will be referred to the Board of Public Works on August 19th and the Transportation Commission on July 22nd. Okay. For any of any folks who were registered on that item. Yeah, they're still here. So I just wanted to right. make sure. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Now, uh, I believe we are on to item number 81. Um, and we do have one uh, person wishing to speak. It's Amy Bar uh, Barrio. I think I'm getting that right. Um, Amy, if you unmute yourself. Yeah, it's Barrio, but that was Barrio. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm I'm here to speak today about uh, city communication. Um, I'm public information officer at Madison Water Utility, one of a handful of public information officers who work um, in our agencies across the city. Um, well, for the last few months, I've been working as part of the JIC, which is the Joint Information Command, um, part of the EOC that was stood up to help out with COVID-19 communication. And um, in that role, uh, a lot of, well, a handful again of uh, communication folks in the city have come together to try to um, get some of these really critical messages out to the public during this pandemic. So, um, you know, I think that communication sometimes seems easy because we all do it every day. We all communicate. Um, but doing this kind of coordinated um, communication across agencies and even across um, different community groups and um, municip municipalities and the University of uh, UW-Madison takes an enormous amount of, of work and planning. And so I'm sure you saw the Mask Up Madison uh, initiative that launched last week um, that took, you know, the JIC, it took the city of Madison, it took Dane County, uh, UW Health, UW Madison, and of course, public health and many community partners 
to plan and launch the Mask Up Madison campaign. And we are only just at the very beginning of doing that. So um, when you look at communication needs in the city, I think it's important to realize that um, information is critical, not just during a pandemic, but, but any time. And planning and coordination and project management all go into that. Um, you know, information is power. And if we want those, um, those things that I think probably everybody uh, in this Zoom call want, um, you know, an equitable, inclusive, uh, city and engaged community, it starts by empowering people with information. What the city has right now is, um, is really critical. So public information officers embedded in their agencies to, um, to handle things that are critical to those agencies. So when you have an explosion downtown, you need Cynthia Schuster, who's been embedded with the fire department, who has the trust of those crews, those men and women who are fighting the fire, who knows the process, who has the trust of the media, who can get information out. When you're opening Goodman Pool tomorrow, you need Ann Shea, who's been working in parks, who knows what's going on, knows what the critical information is that the public needs to know. So you've got that part happening in the city, but what is so badly needed is uh, coordination across agencies. When you have something like this pandemic that touches every agency, or something like the census or something like town of Madison coming into the city. Um, this is really important information that, that needs to be put out in a coordinated and structured and planned way. So I can say that probably this, um, this position that's before you um, doesn't seem like it's gonna solve all the communication issues that the city has and it certainly will not but it's a step um, that is, you know, from my perspective, as someone who's been working in communications in the city for seven years, is, is long, long overdue. Um, we need to start building out those things, um, the communication infrastructure that is gonna be required to really reach people. You can't communicate with one person in one way. You have to communicate in many ways with as many different audiences as you can reach. And you can't have meaningful outreach or engagement or a, a group of, of people who live in your city who feel empowered to participate in government um, without getting the basic down first, which is clear information um, brought to people where they are in a way that is meaningful to them. So. Um, you know, as somebody who's been doing this sort of coordination role here for the last, um, well, since the pandemic started, uh, you know, I can see that, um, that the need is great. And um, we've been uh, building a lot during a global pandemic, and that's hard, but um, I don't want to see it uh, fall apart as we move into the future. Thank you. Are there questions for the registrant? All right, seeing none, uh, President Carter, a motion? Yes. <clears throat> Legistar, eight, uh, item 81, Legistar 60499, approve, recommend to council to adopt, requires 15 votes. Second to adopt. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Is there any uh, questions for staff or discussion? Alder Foster. Thank you. Um, so uh, I guess first I'll just say um, I'm very supportive of investing in communication and I agree with the identified gaps that we heard from our speaker tonight and I think that are behind this proposal and the, the history of um, a position like this. Um, I personally am uh, improving communication for 
residence was really one of the primary reasons I ran for office. And it's something that I'm really deeply committed to. Um, that being said, I don't believe that this uh, role as it's currently in front of us and as it's imagined is going to make the kind of progress that I think we really need to make here. Uh, and I think it's my primary concern with it is that it's <clears throat> imagined as a communications coordinator and that it will have no uh, direct HR responsibility for our existing PIO team. So we have somewhere in the range of seven FTE of existing PIOs embedded in different agencies uh, across the city. And this role as imagined is not going to be a manager or a director and is not gonna be able to um, really do, do the kind of direction and the, and the kind of um, change that I think is needed to really marshal those resources and um, really get our communications to be more effective. I think that if we hire this, uh, this person as it's imagined right here, it's gonna be an incredibly frustrating position for someone who are asking to communicate and yet all of the people that they're supposed to be wrangling together still report to somebody else. So you've got a PIO in engineering that's reporting to Rob Phillips. You've got a, a PIO in the police department, one in fire department, one at the water utility that are all answering to somebody who's not this communications coordinator. And I think that's a recipe for disaster. Um, and I think I've heard from PIOs why they feel that it's really valuable and important to have that embedded nature of the PIOs. And I think there are ways to uh, retain some of those uh, aspects. I think we can have PIOs that have closer relationships with different agencies. But I also don't think that our current um, allocation of PIOs is necessarily the way that we ideally want it. You know, it's, I'm, there, there's a lot of just facts of history as to why certain agencies have a dedicated PIO and why others don't. And I think that thinking forward to what may be the most difficult budget that any council has been faced with, at least that's what we've been told, where we're going to be making massive cuts, we're going to be closing libraries, we're going to be doing all kinds of stuff that nobody is going to be able to stomach doing, but we're going to have to do, right? We're going to have to figure out all the good stuff that we're not going to be able to have anymore to add another FTE to fill a new position that again, I don't, I just don't feel like it's going to get us what we're hoping it's going to get us. Uh, I think that would be a real mistake. I think the other big issue for me is that, um, you know, so again, we've got seven, let's say with this eight FTEs that are primarily pushing information out to residents. I mean, that's, that's, the primary task of these folks. And the TFOGS implementation group met last week for the first time, and we'll be working to bring those recommendations in front of council for review. And several of those recommendations really speak to the issues around resident engagement and around the significant gap that we have there. And there's a recommendation to create an office of resident engagement so that we can actually start to, to get meaningful engagement. Cause we, we honestly just hardly ever do that. It's really, really, really hard and we're not set up to do it and we don't have anyone accountable to do it. And so here we are contemplating adding an ACE FTE to push information out, right. To improve our coordination so we can do better social media campaigns I and mean, things that are worthwhile. So we can just continue to send our message out to residents and we have, and then we're failing to add any accountability for hearing back from residents. And to me, that's, you know, we can't engage residents if we just push information out at them. And so my ask with this is really that uh, I, I do think it's a worthy investment to get someone who would have that overall accountability for our communications that can actually build a strategy for us but that also includes resident engagement because communication cannot be 
one way. And that's what it has been. And for us to pay more, you know, use more of public tax dollars so that we can push the message we want out to residents and not take meaningful steps to actually hear from them. I just, I, I don't think that doesn't resonate with me. And I think right now we have a trust issue with residents. I think a lot of residents are really frustrated with city government and adding another communications person to amplify the message that we're choosing to send out there and not addressing this huge gap that we're not actually hearing people. I just think it's a mistake. And, um, you know, in, in either case, I think this needs to be part of our budget deliberations. I think that the mayor needs to put this in the executive budget that is presented to us. And we need to look at this investment along with all the other investments that we need to balance. And we need to make a decision on it there. So I'm going to vote no against this at this time. And I would encourage others to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Elder. Alder Furman. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I have a few thoughts, but um, one thing I did want to take advantage of is the fact that um, Alder Foster did bring up uh, uh, the PIO positions on the combination, and we do have a PIO here, so I wanted to see if Amy had any thoughts to share about that, and then I do have a bunch of different thoughts about this position um, that I'll go to after that. Great. Thank you, Alder. We'll come back to you. Um, Amy? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I have to say, um, I, I'm here to answer anyone's questions about PIOs and how they operate and why they're embedded in their agencies and why that's important. I think sometimes, well, I think it's first, it's important to point out that some of the employees who are being uh, mentioned as PIOs actually have other jobs like recycling coordinator um, within those agencies. Um, they're not, you know, just strictly PIO as I am. Um, but sometimes there's this notion that we can all kind of come together like transformers and make one giant PIO that can handle the du duties across the city. Um, that's really not the case. There is um, a vast amount of information that needs to be communicated in some agencies. Tana Elias in the library. I mentioned Ann Shea in parks, um, you know, Cynthia Schuster in fire. Uh, and for me at Madison Water Utility, I could never um, do a live interview about PFAS if I was not embedded at Madison Water Utility. It is a complicated topic. I could never talk about radium at our well near um, UW Hospital if I wasn't embedded at Madison Water Utility and had that knowledge of working in that building every single day at every meeting. Um, a lot of people um, who are working in this role are dealing with complicated, um, important information. And so I think that what you have is the bare minimum with PIOs. It's important. They should be there. Um, they serve a, a critical role to get information out. Um, and again, as I mentioned, um, in terms of engagement, I also oversee all of the engagement work at Madison Water Utility, all the promotion of conservation, uh, all the classrooms, all the water wagon, all those moments when we get feedback from people, when we're talking to people, when we're in the community, um, when we're at parks or in schools. Um, if you look at the library and all of the vast amount of engagement that happens there, you cannot take Tana Elias out of the library and put her somewhere else and expect that to function. So, um, you know, I, I didn't come here totally expecting to um, talk about the PIO role in this detail. Otherwise, I would have had a list in front of me about who handles what and their other responsibilities um, uh, in many cases, in addition to that PIO role. But um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, starting out with someone who, you know, which this position appears to be, and, and I had nothing to do with the creation of this position or where it is or anything like that. Um, but having someone who can act as a, a project manager to get some communication out has to happen before you will have an engaged community. You must be able to get information out effectively before you can engage people, before you can do that outreach, before you can 
Um, have people empowered to come to you with their voices. You need to have an organized, strategic way to reach them first. And this position will not be able to do it all. I can tell you that right now. But I think, um, you know, there has to be some kind of a step in that direction. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Alder Foster, or excuse me, Alder Furman, back to you. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Amy. Um, I, 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 I feel strongly that we need this role. Um, I have uh, been, uh, been part of discussions on this since uh, 2018. Um, when it was put back in the budget, when it was put in the budget then uh, as part of the IT department and put back in again uh, last year as part of the IT department. Um, I, I do think, as Alder Foster said, that there needs to, um, I do think long term we need to look at how what the coordination is and whether or not it works to have PIOs in their own departments or not. I do um, very much understand what Amy says, uh, uh, the embedded nature is incredibly important. Um, I'm not convinced uh, that if um, uh, PIOs aren't directly reporting to this coordinator or this this PI, PIO position um, that there can't be good coordination. And I think obviously time will tell and I think we'll figure that out pretty quickly. Um, but there, there desperately needs to be somebody that's coordinating our city um, education efforts. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I was thinking about here that I'm going to bring up again, um, uh, one of my favorites is uh, the, the prohibition on uh, straws or the, the straw distribution ordinance. Um, I think, you know, Alder Abbas knows I've argued very much that I've would have rather have seen that be an education campaign um, than some sort of punishment campaign um, to, to get people to change their behaviors. Um, there is no good way to do stuff like that with, with uh, you know, citywide coordination and, and resources. Um, I think we, we really as a city should be trying to educate people and let them know about different things that are going on and different ways of doing things um, rather than in that case uh, uh, looking at ways to, to, to punish people to change their behavior. So I think, I think there, this is a great opportunity um, to uh, you know, get this position going. Um, we did have a discussion of this as part of our budget in 2019. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, on the table at that time was something that I do also strongly believe in as the Office of Resident Engagement. And, um, you know, we decided not to not to push that yet, push that yet um, due to the cost of putting something like that together. But, but I strongly believe that that is something we need to do as well. Um, I think the idea that we would hire a PIO or hire somebody that would be a PIO and, uh, you know, run that office or be part of that office is asking way too much of an individual. I think we have a need right now to get a PIO uh, in place. Um, and I really do want to see us look at, um, you know, on the TFOGS implementation committee, um, you know, implementing um, what we talked about, which was an administrative team um, that get together and start working on things and long term, absolutely have the resident office of resident engagement. I think that will make, um, you know, a lot of things in our city a lot better, um, and, and, you know, including our ability to, to react to what residents want and need. Um, but right now, I think this is an incredibly important thing for us to do with uh, all the challenges we have. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Rummel. Sorry if I missed this. When is it um, the idea that this person would start? Is it like a third quarter start or sooner or closer to next year? What is the thinking? Uh, Alder Rommel, if this position is, uh, if this is adopted tonight, uh, we would move as quickly as possible, I think, to get this person in place. So there would be some budget savings for half a year, but then we would use the money that was allocated. And it's... That it's not new money, it's rearranged money. Uh, that's correct. Although this has been in the budget for several years now um, in the IT department. And I believe that Sarah Edgerton's here and could speak to that if you want, but it, it has been in the budget and that's correct. We would realize at least a half a year of salary savings. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. All right, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion is to adopt. Is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of adoption? Alder Kemble. Roll call, please. Thank you, Alder. All right, so the motion is to adopt. All those in favor, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, I will unmute you all and the clerk will call the roll. Alder Hutt. Aye. Aye. Hennick. No. No. Kemble? No. No. Lemmer? Aye. Aye. 
Martin? Martin? Sorry, I. I. Moreland? I. I. Pastor Giacomo? No. No. Rummel? I. I. Skidmore? No. No. Tierney? I. I. Verveer? I. I. Abbas? No. No? No. No. Alboris? No. No. Balde? Who was that last one? <coughs> Balde? No. No. Bidar? I. I. Carter? I. I. Evers? No. No. Foster? No. No. Furman? I. I. Harrington McKinney? No. No. It is 10 and 10. With 10 eyes, that item fails. And we'll move on to item number 88. That was split along the Satya ass kickers line. Thank you, Alder. Uh, item number 88, we have a number of registrants starting with Tiffany Kenny of West Washington Ave in support wishing to speak. Uh, there's no Tiffany Kenny or Erica Romberg in the queue. Uh, all right. So neither of the folks that wish to speak on this item are present. Um, staff will share with you the list of registrants not wishing to speak. So President Carter, a motion. And I'm sorry, what number are we on? We're on item number 88. And I believe item the, 80. the motion is to refer. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Alder. Nope. 88, let's just star 60995. Um, the motion is to, I thought the motion was to adopt. Am I wrong? I believe this is one of the items that we have a substitute on. Um, uh, I think there's some misnumbering here, but I'm yes, I believe that, um, that this is one of the items that we have a substitute on to be referred to EDC tomorrow and um, uh, finance on Monday and then back to the next council meeting, but Alder Verveer can perhaps clear this up for us. Oh. Alder Verveer? Verveer? I see it. I'm sorry, President Carter, do you wish to make the motion then? Yes, I see it now. Sorry, I dropped the sheet. Very good. Yes, um, I'll yield to you. motion you. to re-refer substitute to the EDC on uh, July 15th, Finance Committee July 20th, and Common Council July 21st. Second. Thank you, Alder. Second uh, to re-refer. Moved and seconded to re-refer. Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, although, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of re-referral? Seeing no objection, that item is referred. And that brings us to item number 91, uh, which is a presentation from staff. I believe that's Brian Grady. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present here on the, the Council Plan Progress Update. I'm going to share my screen here and give a just a real brief presentation. Um, just one second here. Um, so hopefully, folks can see my the PowerPoint here. Um, uh, here presenting the, our very first annual. 
uh, comp plan progress updates uh, should be in your Legistar item here. Um, what we're doing is really kind of, uh, kind of doing our first check-in, our first test update of the comp plan since it was, um, since it was adopted in uh, August of 2018. So here we're approaching about the two year anniversary of this plan being adopted by the Common Council. Um, the result of a, of a major, a very major uh, public engagement uh, effort to reach many folks. What we're doing here with this plan is updating our 2006 comp plan. Uh, one of the main goals for this process was to really include the community and in weighing in on the, the plan's recommendations, its contents. And certainly also to make it more um, streamlined, more concise than our previous version, which would allow us to better monitor progress and better report out progress on a more concise, a more action-oriented uh, document, right, action-oriented plan. As I mentioned, we interacted with uh, many thousands of people uh, through this process. Uh, we had a, a significant budget for this, so it seems an opportunity to really engage uh, all parts of our community in a, in a, in a city process, a city planning process. We engaged uh, many thousands of folks, but we also engaged many different people in, in many different ways. And our main focus was to reach folks that are unrepresented in our inner community and less likely to be involved in city processes or even planning processes. And so uh, through all this, uh, we were reaching folks that again were involved in city processes for maybe the first time. Um, we received a lot of feedback during the planning process as we were formulating the recommendations, talking with, with residents, getting feedback that you know, the city has uh, maybe engaged them previously, uh, that, uh, previously engaged on many different occasions. And they're only wanting to see how their feedback would be used in the plan. How would it shape the plan? And so during the planning process, we're very careful to show how feedback was received and how it was impacting drafts as the plan is being, as being put together. And they also wanted to know, you know, how will I know that my feedback is really having a lasting impact in the community and a positive impact on the community? And so what this, pro what this uh, progress update does really help kind of complete the the feedback loop. And so again, during the planning process, we had a more smaller immediate feedback loop of showing how people's feedback was being uh, incorporated into the plan. Now we're doing that more full scale feedback loop where we've received feedback. It's been incorporated into the plan. Uh, we've now had some time, about two years to take action on some of the implementation uh, recommendations in the plan. And then finally here reporting back on what we've been doing. Um, uh, overall, our, our, just like our, with our current comp plan, trying to keep it more concise, uh, more streamlined, more action oriented. We try to keep the same thing with this document. It's about maybe, I don't know, 28 pages or so. Uh, we kind of organized it by the six elements of, of the comp plan document. Uh, we'll look to add a health and safety element uh, to the next year's edition. Uh, but overall, what we're trying to do is, again, just provide an update on what the city's been up to and how we've uh, made progress where we have and some of the plan's um, recommendations. Um, I'll, I'll mention that in putting this document together, uh, just like with the comp plan, it involves many different folks from across the city. And so even in just creating this document here, we, we interact with about uh, 35 staff members from about 18 different departments. This is truly a, a citywide effort. And even doing this update, uh, putting this together was, was a group effort. So I do wanna thank staff that really contributed from all across, all across the city. Um, for each of the sections, each of the elements, the six elements we have so far in this version, uh, we're spotlighting uh, one project, one activity that we've made some progress over the calendar year 2019. And so in this case, for the first element, land use transportation, we're spotlighting some of the uh, progress in bringing bus rapid transit to the city. And then also additional one spotlight project, we're spotlighting about nine or 10 other activities that have advanced plan recommendations. And so there's about... Um, about eight to 10 strategies for each element. For their detail, there's about uh, 30 or so actions, these more detailed action steps. So we're pulling out, again, about nine or 10 of things that we've done as a city, as a community. We're not always the leader in some of these activities, uh, what we've done to advance uh, plan plan progress. Um, and so we can kind of we kind of follow through on this, and then uh, kind of finish off the kind of three parts of each each element is the kind of action status. And so here, for that land use transportation element, we've listed for all the nine strategies and the thirty or so actions uh, where our status is at for each of these. It includes the lead agency who's leading the implementation of this, and also where we're at. So for 
actions that are have a what we think a more kind of clear completion point. Uh, actions are either not started, in progress, or complete. And there's also many actions here that are policies or things to consider as, as we're making decisions. Those are probably more ongoing. You listed those as just as ongoing, but this kind of gives you a little status bar here at the end of this uh, second page of the actions to kind of show where we're at. And I think overall what's been helpful is the comp plan is it brings together recommendations you know, that, that shows how the, the city wants to move to in the future. Um, this can help uh, build out, help update division uh, work plans, so guide what we're working on, which department's kind of working on. It's certainly impacting budget requests, consideration of the budget. And so, again, this allows us to kind of measure where we're at, we're making progress, uh, where we may need to uh, advance other, other measures. We then repeat this. I won't do this in this presentation. We'll repeat this for each of the six elements uh, we have here for neighborhoods and housing. Again, a spotlight project and uh, highlighting other, other highlights, again, from the where progress was clearly made in the 2019 calendar year. We do that for each of the, of the uh, six elements. And again, our, our main goal is uh, through this process to uh, have this, you know, kind of this is our first crack at it, first development of this project. We've had a review by the uh, Transportation Planning, Planning and Policy Board, also the Planning Commission, uh, now the Common Council. Um, but our goal is to really uh, have this accepted by the, by the council, certainly take any uh, comments, suggestions you all have, but then get this back in the hands of the folks that really did help inform the plan. And so these are the resident panels that we uh, worked with during the plans process, the planning process. We have an email subscriber list, uh, I think over a thousand folks when we did the process. We want to report back on what we've done and I think it was actually a very, uh, very uh, telling moment. We were at the TPB, TPBB meeting about a month ago, and uh, Baltasar, I think it said, uh, I, I, I'm messing up his name, but Baltasar from the Latino Academy for Workforce Development uh, had mentioned that, oh yes, I remember the Imagine Madison covers a plan. We have a copy of the plan uh, on our table at the Workforce Academy. And so he was kind of curious as to where we're at. And so we're hoping to have this document, because him document in the hands of all the folks that did help contribute and help shape the plan to which we can show where we're at. And then, I, 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 but honestly, it's kind of a great communication tool to keep folks more engaged in this process and continue implementation of the plan. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that folks might have uh, or any other suggestions as again, it's kind of our first, uh, first version of this document. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions or comments for planning staff? Seeing none, thank you. And that is the end of our items tonight. Are there any uh, other items for introduction from the floor or announcements? Seeing none, Alder Moreland. I move to adjourn. Uh, it's moved and Alder Carter. And I just asked one question before I do that. Did we look at Legistar 61377 to be referred to finance? I think we did. Yep, that was on the consent agenda, Alder. Then I moved. Oh, uh, you, I second. <laughs> moved and seconded adjournment. to adjourn. <laughs> Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of adjournment? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you all and have a good night. Good night.